so we're here once again for another Extra Vibe special. As ever, I'm joined by Lee Graham. Um, this episode won't be like some others, though, because everything else generally has a name, doesn't it? You know, new wave of British heavy metal, n- new wave of classic rock, which we uh, spoke about last time. But we feel, as we were discussing last time we had that video, the new wave of classic rock video, that there was kind of a for want of a better word, like an original new wave of classic rock. There was a movement that was before the the current set now. And we kind of want to just highlight a few of those bands and a few of those albums. I mean, some of these bands are still around today, but they're in this kind of weird place where they can't be categorized as new wave because they're not technically new. But yes, uh, we'll jump straight into things. As, as ever, I'm sure that uh, Lee has some honorable mentions. Uh, yeah, man. Like you say, it was. Uh, I mean, the, the era told us that was sort of just before that. What we would now consider new wave of classic rock. Mm. That was very much the sort of very well set that college first year uni part, and all these bands that we're going to start talking about um, came through. So it was very easy for me to think of. Uh, there's two that really did jump in and out. Um, mm. uh, the first one is um, uh, Wolf Mother, self titled. Yes. Oh my god. Because that was an album that really, really kicked in. Um, I probably would have put them further up the list. Mm. But for me, as we're doing them as bands rather than just necessarily yeah. the albums, um, that was the one solid punch that they had for me personally. Yeah, um, I think that their debut was absolutely storming. I was so excited for what was to come. Mm. And I think because of the lineup changes that they had, I would never felt that they quite grabbed hold of that momentum again. Mm. And with some great songs after it, but as like a whole album, I don't mm-hmm. think uh, they did it. So that's why they didn't make it into the top 10 necessarily. And one that just kept jumping in and out. And if I, if I could have, have had an 11, I definitely would have put this in. And it mm-hmm. was um, Airborne and Running Wild. I forgot about Airborne, but yeah. you are correct. Yeah. I would have, yeah, I would have totally have put them in that uh, kind of honorable mention category. Again, it's like because of this weird period that mm-hmm. these bands fall in, some of them can just kind of slip through the cracks, don't they? You know, really. Um, but yes, uh, me by because like there was a mate of mine who wasn't into, he was much more into sort of yeah, Slipknot, Metallica, and Megadeth. Mm heavier stuff than i was necessarily but he'd heard it from his brother and was like have you heard these and i was like no and he's like oh they sound exactly like acdc and i was like that's such a generic term to mention you know yeah i was like, as soon as he said it, i was like i don't care and then like he bought me a copy of it for christmas because i just kept ignoring him basically yeah. <laughs> and i was just like man I, I'm, I'm not interested and then he bought me a copy of it and uh i was like, oh, he's gonna buy it for me I'll, I'll listen to it then he obviously cares that much about it and yeah chugged it on i was like Wow. Okay, I was completely wrong. You know, this is Bon Era. This is you know, but new and sounded more rose tattoo as well. And yeah, it did keep jumping in and out. And it was just one of those moments where I'm like, oh, I wish I could have just one yeah. more. But uh, you're you're a cool man. Number eleventh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I get it. Um, my honourable mentions. Uh, I'm going to jump in with a niche one that maybe for those out there they might remember this band. But uh, a band called Stone Rider. Yeah. Can anybody remember them? Eh? Uh, they, their debut album, uh, Three Legs of Trouble, that came out in 2008, believe it or not, um, was released on uh, Roadrunner. So there was a bit of a Roadrunner thing going on for a while, wasn't there? Like quite a few yeah. bands coming through there. But uh, for those that aren't familiar, um, which I'm sure will be quite a few now, uh, it was like if you had. Uh, kind of Mick Jagger on vocals, but with like a real hard rock band. Yeah, it was. Um, I support in Europe. Okay. They did. Um, I want to see Europe on the Bag of Bones tour mm. at, uh, at Shepherd's Bush, and they opened it up, and I went and bought that album off the guys themselves. Yeah. Their um, guitarist is now in another outfit called the Pinks, who keep getting singles sent into the um, mm. radio show. They're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's it was a weird one. It was kind of uh, they had like one big album, uh, and I think they did have two other releases, but they they didn't carry on with Roadrunner, so it kind of fell under the radar. But I remember around that time, there was like classic rock magazine were really bigging them up, 
is kind of in a, a next big band. And for whatever reason, it didn't quite, you know, culminate. But, you know, it's one of them things. Uh, my other honorable mention, which I think you'll be going, oh, my God, how have you put this in the honorable mentions? But this shows how strong the list is. This would be my number 11 if right. it, if it could be. So it's the temperance movement with the that first album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You see, I think that some of this can come down to personal taste. Okay. For me, yeah, for me, it was it was one of those. It was like, you know, I just enjoyed the other 10 albums a little bit more. Yeah. But it, you could certainly argue in terms of impact, they made it made of an impact there. But also, I, I think that in terms of like we've so we've gone with a bit of a, a time frame of like a 13 year period. So we've gone from, let me check here, 1999 to about 2012. Um, and they're kind of on that line. They're right at the end of that era. So maybe that's part of my thinking, that they're kind of on the tail end there. Um, but yeah, it's it's purely just because every other album, I just enjoyed that a little bit more. And um, my last on rule mention is... Because people will be shouting this one. They'll be going, why isn't the Foo Fighters in this list? Because they're so influential. They're right. such a, a big band. But their first album was in 1995, just to make yeah. you feel really old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of the Foo's, and then I thought, yeah, their first album is mid-90s. So. Yeah, I mean, obviously they had such a big impact in the 2000s right the way through, and they were kind of one of those bands that was spearheading things and probably still are. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, they were obviously born out of Nirvana. So there was there was that whole thing that happened there. And I think that they, they kind of live, I mean, probably still do now, they kind of live in their own little bubble, don't they? Yeah. Away from any, anything else, so a bit of an anomaly. But, yes, uh, that is my uh, honourable mentions. Um, we'll jump straight into it, the, the top ten. So what's Lee's number ten? So my top 10 is a band that I think often get overlooked, uh, mm-hmm. just how big an impact they had at the time. Uh, the main album I'm focusing on is their Get Born album, which came out in 2003. Mm. Which, everyone remembers Are You Gonna Be My Girl? You know, it's still used on Live at the Apollo and everything mm. else the adverts get used on. But that album came out in 2003. Mm. So in the real, real height of new metal, when I was like 15, you know, in the height of Slipknot and System of Down and Corn and all that sort of stuff coming out. And, you know, I came from a background where my dad loved Aerosmith and Led Zeppelin and Purple, so all that kind of hard rock stuff I still love. Um, but, you know, you do teenage thing, you go off and find other things and, you know, what we all do and find what we really like. And then I remember the Jet album coming out and being like, oh, that's what I like still. I like mm. guitar riffs and melodies. I mean, tracks like uh, Look What You've Done On It, which is so somewhere between ELO and Beatles, it's unreal. Um mm. And it kicks off of Last Chance, which is really kind of Hives esque. Um, and I remember it just being an album where I was suddenly like, "Okay, you you can just be raw garage hard rock and roll. It's fine." Mm-hmm. And this is an album that started to bring me back to that. And you know, for a couple of years, you couldn't go past the karaoke bar without someone screaming, "Are oh, you going to be my girl?" Very badly. Probably recently split up from a, a, a partner <laughs> and dejected and drunk, but. Uh, you know, I just think it's an album that gets overlooked because the single was so huge that it kind of gets mm. looked at as of, you know, oh, well, it, they only really had that one hit. But if you actually look at the album and the subsequent album they released after that as well, when I saw them for the second time supporting Aerosmith for Hyde Park, um, you know, they were, it was them, then The Answer, then Chris Cornell, and, and then Aerosmith. And the, they had all of Hyde Park in their hand. Hmm. And on the second album, I felt like they really held their own sound wise and that they were going to, I thought, this is it. This is, you know, next time I come to Hyde Park, they'll be headlining. Or they'll mm. be fair about the bill. And then they split up, which was a shame. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they are reforming because I'm a very old man now. And that album is 20 years old. Uh, it's which crazy, is, isn't it? There's a few of these in this list that mm. you look back on and you're like, Jesus, that was 20 years ago. Yeah, I know. So that's my number 10. Mm, so uh, my number 10, I'm going with a band that is still around today. Um, they've kind of weirdly crossed over into the new wave of classic rock. So they they sit in kind of two eras. 
uh, despite being formed back in 2008. Uh, so it's the treatment with their debut album, uh, oh. This Might Hurt. And that that was actually, their debut album was released in 2011, believe it or not. I did a bit of research. I thought, no, nah, that must be later. But it, no, it was 2011. So uh, that was an interesting one. Obviously, they came out with that uh, that first single, Doctor. I believe it was Doctor, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. um, and it's just great classic rock, isn't it? You know, it's, it's great classic rock, done well. And um, they're like a, a further on iteration of a band that I may mention later on. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, you know, they've got that kind of classic Bond Scott era ACDC vibe, and it's just done really well. And it's really enjoyable. And, um, you know, there was kind of, obviously, we had Airborne um, and we had that. But it, at that period of time, there wasn't a tremendous amount of bands that were kind of like that, apart from Airborne. Um, yeah. So they were kind of on their own there doing that thing. And they, they had that tour with Kiss. And they, they made an impact there, didn't they? So. Really? Um, I feel like this has to come in at number 10 uh, for that reason. So my number nine, uh, it's an album that I still, uh, and a band that I still spin regularly. I said album because they only released one, uh, which is why they're a little lower down the list than some others. Um, again, one that next year is approaching 20 years. Cool. Uh, and yeah, because I remember seeing these guys for the first time. I went to see Belt Revolver um, mm. with my dad down at Brixton, and these guys came out and opened it up, and it was one of those moments where you just like, Okay, I know who's in Velvet Revolver, and I know they're going to be really good because that was the first time I no, sorry, it was the second time I'd seen Velvet Revolver. It was the first time I saw them was downloaded a couple of months prior. Um, but I knew they were, they were Velvet were going to storm it, but mm. equally there was still that part of your brain that went, "Oh, they're going to have to bring it like their A game here. They can't come mid level. They're going to have to come full out." Um, and the band Silvertide, and I, I felt that was coming. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a band that I still listen to regularly. Uh, the, 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 they're out, the debut album, Show and Tell, and the American XS EP. It's, they're still regularly spun in the, in the, in this household and in my car and everywhere I go and still spun regularly on, on radio show. It's just, they just stormed it. They were, Ooh. they were a band that I were, I was convinced, um, were gonna, um, make the cup. They were gonna go the distance. They were gonna, to, you know, do the thing. You know, they had the they had the goods and a really solid debut, um, and they were a band that, for people my age and who remember them, and, and a few a bit younger as well, they've sort of had this become this kind of cult status. Mm. And there's definitely been moments where you know I'll put up a social media post saying, "Oh, I listened to this today," and the amount of comments it always gets. Oh, I remember those guys. I remember this mm. album. Yeah. You know. There's bands I've interviewed who um, have said, you know what I'm saying? Oh, who are your inspiration? And they're a bit younger than me. And they've gone, well, we remember when Silver Tide came out and we were really like this mm-hmm. album. And it's like, what? You know, it's it had a really big impact. And they've also gone on to do other things. Nick Perry, especially, he's done Satellite Party um, with um, Perry Farrell, the Jane's Addiction, for example. And he's been involved with a host of other projects. Um, saw him live with a few other things. And... They've been good, but I'm not sure they ever quite had... There was a magic, you know, there's a chemistry when people get in the same room. And this one was one that really knocked it out of the park for me. And seeing them both supporting Velvet Revolver and their download 2005, I was convinced they were set for their trajectory. And uh, But again, I'm hoping, and I hope they haven't just randomly, like, changed their profile picture just to do something on social media. Mm. but they did put a, a more recent photo of them all together and put just what is next year and like I say next year is 20th anniversary of this record so I'm hoping not only they will do line shows but I'm hoping they'll come to the UK again because I would love to see if it's still there hopefully they'll put out some more new music you know better, better late than ever sort of thing but uh, I'd love to to see what would happen if they did do that and yeah that's my that's my number nine it's interesting that you can occasionally every now and then have a band that releases just one record, mm. but it just seems to last. And it's like this weird underground thing that if yeah. you mention it to somebody else, they're like, Oh, I know who they were. And you're like kind of instantly friends with them because of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But that, that shows the impact, doesn't it? Um, I'm jumping in with a, a niche one in my number nine. 
some people will remember this brand. Some people will go, who the hell are these? Uh, I mentioned them once before in a video uh, a long time ago. Um, a band called The Parlor Mob uh, with an album uh, and You Were a Crow. That came out in 2008 and they were formed in 2004. Um I feel if they they were kind of ahead of their time, mm. um, they sat in that weird period. And I think if they'd have been uh, kind of today in this new wave of classic rock thing, they'd be kind of jumped on and people would be, you know, picking them up and doing stuff. But they, they had this one album in particular. They've released other things subsequently, but um, that was where the magic was. You know, there was something special about them. It, you know, they had a bit of Led Zeppelin in there, and they had a bit of this, that, and the other. And it had this classic feel, but for this new era, you know, a bit more of a modernised singer, and it was, it just really works. And it's a band that my dad still remembers today. If I yeah. mention, if I mention the Polymer, dad will go, "Oh, I remember that." You know, that guy, that band. Um, and it's kind of, it's become one of these weirdly forgotten albums. It's an underrated album. But at the time, again, uh, the uh, the classic rock magazine people, uh, whoever they may be, um, they were really raving about them. And they, they felt that they were going to be that next kind of, uh, the next big band. And for whatever reason, um, they kind of dropped off a cliff. I believe there was some kind of... Uh, uh, contractual thing with the record label i have a feeling they're another roadrunner band as well oh were they like a one and done one album done it's the thing with roadrunner wasn't it at one point roadrunner were very much mm. you know slipknot amen and all the yeah. really hardcore uh new metal brigade and there's some more industrial stuff as well and then they went for like a real kind of hard rock kind of yeah. era as well yeah, yeah. It's, it was around that time when they signed the Stone Riders and the Parlor Mobs, and I think that they were trying to invest in what they felt was maybe the next generation, that next future, which we're kind of seeing now. Yeah. I think they were looking at trying to find something like that then. So it was just kind of, I felt that they were just at the wrong place, you know? Like, if you put them today, they'd, they'd do well. And I'd certainly say to people to go and check that album out. Yeah, my number eight is as a band you mentioned in your honorable mentions mm. and it's the temperance movement you know they were a band that for me really kicked up a trajectory very quickly mm. and made a huge impact you know i remember um hearing only friend on planet rock and just from that initial intro riff i was like what the hell's that mm. who is it i've not heard this before and then hearing phil's voice and it was just like this is cool mm. and then finding out that you know they only had an EP out <laughs> and I couldn't get hold of it, which made me kind of want to get into the more because I couldn't grab anything. You know, nothing was online at that point uh, mm. for them, not easily anyway. Um, the EP, I, you could only sort of get at gigs and whatnot. And then by chance, they happened to be supporting Rival Sons mm. um, when I saw them at Norwich, uh, Warf not Warfront, it was the Art Centre. Um, saw them then, was absolutely blown away. Um, went on a bit of a punt, if I'm honest. Mm. It's like, Royal Sons are going, I'll go to that. And then they came on, I was like, oh, it's those guys. I didn't realise who it was for the first few songs because I'd only still heard Only Friend. Mm. And I bought the EP. Then I came back and a mate of mine, I was giving him lift to work. And I was on giving lift home from town and I had the EP on in the car. And he was like, oh, who's this? And I'm like, it's the movement. And then as I dropped him off the house, he nicked it out of my car and ran off. <laughs> I was like, you get, I've only just got this like two weeks ago. I've been trying to get, you know, and then the next time we saw them, they came around and they're playing the waterfront of their own show and to see them at the whole, their own headline show. It's still a Norwich waterfront, which is only, you know, 1500 cap downstairs. And it was like, mm -hmm. these guys have got something and they're really making an impact here. And they current, the, for me, the reason they're a bit further up the bill than some of the other bands I've mentioned so far. It's mm. just because for me, they kept releasing really good albums, you know, White Bear that came on after that. And then Between the Lines, the third album, you know, all solid albums for me. I, they had mm. some lineup changes and the sound evolved, but that's going to happen when people make albums and you get new people come in. Mm. Um, you know, the next time they came around to the UK, they were supporting the Stones. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? A year after I see them at Norwich Waterfront, 
Mm. They support, they're out touring with the Stones mm. and as main support for like the whole UK and European tour, doing all these stadiums and all these huge arenas. And then, you know, last time I saw them was they were sub headlining at Download Festival, mm. you know, um, to Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what? Mm. Um, you know, that was the last, you know, and then, you know, we, we know that Phil obviously went on to do other things and his, his new album I absolutely love. Um, that's the, that's a topic for another show. Uh, <laughs> but I just think Tempers Movement had such a big impact. Mm. Um, and they really did start paving the way for others. I've always joked that it's been a bit of a lineage because I went to see Rival Sons and then I saw the Temperance Movement support Rival Sons. I then went to go see Temperance Movement and I saw the Gravel Tones support the Temperance Movement. Mm. I went to go see the Gravel Tones and I saw Tax the Heat support Gravel Tones and became a fan of them. Now, if I ever go see a Tax the Heat headline show and they've got a rubbish support act, I'm going to blame them because I'll stop. They're the letting show. them down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's just been this sort of lineage, and I just think they were always striving to improve stuff. Mm. And then, yeah, you know, sadly, it's it's on hiatus. It's stopped. It's gone for now. Whatever, you know, who's to say what the future will bring? Uh, I hope they come back at some point. But yeah, that they're for my my number eight. Mm. No, no, I agree. I mean, that's a a fast ascension. There, you know, to go from you know playing this small venue to to. Uh, Mm. Just being under the stones, I mean, that's <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, my number eight, um, this is one that you'll be more of a fan of. For me, this is more about kind of the overall impact that they had on the scene. I, fe I feel that they needed to be included. They're not necessarily a band that I really connected with but i was it's one of them they they became so big that you can't help but mention them like you feel like you have to mention them because there's such a thing particularly in this era uh so it's buck cherry with uh 15 um obviously their debut album came out in 1999 so right on the end of our uh uh at the beginning of their uh, uh list there and uh that 15 came out in 2005 and that was around the time when i was in secondary school like I'd have just started. So there you go for, for people out there that are feeling old. Uh thanks, mate. Yeah. <laughs> and uh it was it became a thing, like all of a sudden, you know, you were seeing the the kids that were liking the slip knots and liking this that, and the other. And then all of a sudden it was like the it was cool to like Buck Cherry. Buck yeah. Cherry became a big, big thing. Um yeah, it was it was interesting. That album in particular was the one, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think you you'll know much more about that that kind of that Buck Cherry thing there. But um, they they became inignorable. You just knew, and and I know that uh, Josh Todd was like guesting on different hmm. uh, you know bands and like different uh, singles and stuff. And it seemed like they were everywhere for a, for a, for that period of time. So. I feel that they needed to be included in this kind of uh, original new wave of classic rock movement. And the reason I'm smiling, mate, is because my number seven is Buck Cherry. Mm. <laughs> See, I saw it coming. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a big Buck Cherry fan. Um, mm. know that. But, you know, I, I'd agree with you. I would say 15 is definitely what I would say was their most impactive record. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they came out, like you say, 99, uh, came out with a debut. I remember hearing Lit Up. Um, I'm not sure I probably should have been hearing a song about cocaine use <laughs> um, at the age yeah. of, well, 99, so what have I been? 11. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I really knew what it meant anyway. Um, mm. But, you know, I remember hearing that. I had a Kerrang compilation album thing and, and Lit Up was on there. And I remember hearing this track and it just coming in and I was like, yeah, again, you know, it was like late nineties. So, you mm. know, I was born, I was born 87. So grew up around the whole Britpop era and my dad's records. And then suddenly there was this then modern day version of, of Aerosmith, ACDC mm. uh, and everything like that. You know, it was, it was all this sort of amalgamated together with this all kind of punk rock quality about it. And I actually loved it. And then they kind of went away for a little bit. Mm. Uh, the, most of the original lineup 
split they kind of went separate ways for a little while they did their debut they then did their time bomb record which came out 2002 uh they went quiet for a few years um when we were talking about Vel Revolver performing earlier when Vel Revolver were first getting together when they were just the project Mm. Joss Todd and Keith Nelson of Buck Cherry that were going to be singing so instead of Scott Whelan and instead of Dave Kushner um Mm -hmm. and then they, they wrote some bits together um to a point where uh Keith Nelson has got a writing credit on one of the songs on Contraband, which I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. So Ooh. I'm not going to say the wrong one. But, uh, um, you know, they, to that point then, for whatever reason, you know, things don't work out sometimes. I wasn't in the room. I can't tell you that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that old. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then they went and formed, you know, they went and reformed. And, well, that Keith Nelson and Josh told them, well, let's go redo Buck Cherry and, and yeah. came out with 15. And it was a record where... I think it's fair to say um, no record label particularly wanted them. Mm. You know, they couldn't get a major record deal. They, um, no one was really interested. Everybody was still going through this whole kind of new metal period and they're thinking, oh, hard rock in this era doesn't sell and blah, blah, blah. Um, and they got put on a Japanese label uh, of a version of sort of Japanese offside of uh, Offshoot really? Universal. And the reason the album's called 15 is because they had 15 days to record and mix it. Wow, they only have they're only allowed so much time in the studio to do it because I said they want a real budget, and mm. in 15 days they came out with that. And Crazy. you know, songs like Crazy Bitch and Sorry and Next to You and, and So Far and, and Brooklyn are all still massive staples of their live set. And mm. I think that goes to show you know just how creative they were in that period. And I think they've gone on from there and they've faced adversity. And I think anytime they face a lineup change or something's upsetting the rank somehow, they seem to come out back really fighting and really solid. Um, mm. You know, Keith Nelson, original guitarist, is now left. Um, and it's really just Josh Todd um, from the original, original lineup from the debut. Obviously, they've still got people like Stevie D and everybody in the band now from, from the 15 day era. Um, but then they come back with like Hellbound and their new album X. Uh, for the 10th album that they released this year called X. And to me, Hellbound and X, in terms of quality of record, I think they're the two finest records they've ever done. Mm. I think I think 15 had the biggest impact because no, they'd almost been written off. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd done the two, they'd done the two albums, they kind of went away. Music business is very fickle, as are, as are we all as human race. Something goes away, you find something else to watch or to mm-hmm. listen to, or whatever it might be. And then they came back with this album that was just bang. And in a mix of, uh, you know, I say new metal and rap rock and everything else, you had one of the greatest hard rep- records, hard rock records of all time, in my opinion. And like I say, with those songs still being such a staple of their live set, um, mm. I think that says a lot. And, you know, like I say, they've gone from strength to strength, you know, headlining shows across the country, you know. In, in, in arena venues, we lost the biggest venue I ever saw them was when they did Stone Free Festival and they were sub headlining to Scorpions. Mm. You know, and I'm sort of used to seeing these little punk rock kind of venues and they came in to the middle of the O2 and absolutely slayed it. Mm. So, yeah, they're my number, my number seven. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a big thing. Like, there was a load of kind of, uh, after they particularly brought out 15, you saw quite a few kind of buck cherry-esque bands yeah bands like and everything kind of came along didn't they and yeah like there's a i think that that's always a, a mark of, of of making an impact isn't it you know you see like back in the day van halen are playing and then you'd see a load of like guitarists trying to be like van halen and it's it's always you know it's obviously that flattery imitation and flattery thing and it's you know I think it it shows that like you're you're doing something that that yeah. people are really resonating with if you're getting other people uh, uh, trying to get a slice of that. My number seven, uh, this will be one that you'll be familiar with, and I have mentioned it in an underrated albums list before, and I I feel that. It became underrated over time, but at this period of time, uh, there were a band that were formed way back in 2002 under the name of the the Hurricane Party, but they had to change their name. 
due to an unfortunate hurricane. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, was, it was always asking for it with that name. Uh, they changed it to Roadstar, and of course, people will be a bit more familiar with that. Uh, their debut album, uh, Grand Hotel, right, uh, right. that came out in uh, 2006. 2006? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that came out in 2006. It was one of the, like, this is linked to the question for people that, that watch the podcast. This band is linked to the reasons why I ask uh, musicians, when you were growing up, what was your band mm. growing up? You know, the band that's like the first one for you. Like, this was my band. Okay. You know, like, they were my first one. I think they were... It was possibly the first CD I ever owned, um, you know, because I, I was quite young at that point. So, um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, 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 about Ryan, shut up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, the, these were like my childhood band. So, um, they were like the first out of the gate, and it had that classic rock feel. So, you know, I, at that time, I was listening to these kind of old school bands, you know, I was listening to Led Zeppelin. I was listening to Deep Purple, you know, I was kind of discovering all of these old bands. And around that time, it was like, well, there's not really a, a modern day band that I really connect with. I like some of these other bands, but there's not one that's like for me. And then these guys came along and for whatever reason, they just really struck a chord with me, you know? And I was like, this, this is just done really well. It's produced really well. It's made uh brilliantly and and it's it's got some catchy singles on there got some great songs man i'm glad you mentioned yeah. it because we did joke that there was going to be something that i forgot because you always come up with something and i go of course and this is my of course moment because yeah, yeah like i remember hurricane party coming out and going brilliant there's something a new band doing what yeah. i love and doing it really well and then obviously you know like you say they had to change the name to roadstar because of hurricane katrina and everything and mm. they did roadstar i think they named after themselves after their tour bus didn't they it was out there they got the name from it was something yeah it was it was bus. like a bus or a i know if you google roadstar now it comes up with like motorcycles so it's something some kind of vehicle based thing <laughs> <laughs> but you know they came out of that and then obviously that what they eventually morphed and transitioned and stuff and became heaven's basement yeah uh, which obviously some people might because i want to put heaven's basement in and they were right on that line of like on the edge again isn't it? yeah and i thought well, i can't put heaven's basement in and i didn't even occur to me to go backwards <laughs> well the 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 thing for me which puts them into this particular list even though i feel that they're underrated now on this album mm. in particular was when they released this album, they were given the uh, that classic rock, what was it, new best new band. They were, yeah. Uh, they were the one that were picking up that award. They were the one that were like the hot band in town. And um, I think that, that that really says something because, you know, they were around at the time of the darkness mm. and these bands that were on fire, yet they were, you know, pushing and, and, and starting to break through there. And I felt that, it was like, oh, maybe they could be like the next one there. And it didn't quite happen. But, you know, it was feeling like, oh, maybe they could be the next kind of the one that breaks in. a bubbling kind of boiling point about it, wasn't yeah. it? Like, literally, would, don't for whatever reason, it didn't. But it really mm. so could have easily boiled over to that next stage. This was it. It felt like they were just like, a little bit more and they'd have been there. Um but yeah, I feel that they have to be included for for those two reasons. Yeah, so uh, my number six is going back a, a little further back than that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a band that I think it's very easy to overlook how much of an impact they had on bringing hard rock back to the mainstream. Um, and they've had a good career since, since they reformed as well. But it's the darkness. I think they just have to go up there. Yeah. Um, you know, arguably permission to land was um we mentioned it before when we did our show for, for debut albums you know i saw them supporting my dad's friend's band in a pub mm. and then 18 months later they're headlining reading <laughs> you know it was it was that quick yeah they headlined the back of on reading on the back of permission to land mm. um i think overall in terms of albums i don't think they've necessarily ever quite got to permission to land again mm. um i think they've released some very very good ones more so 
since they reformed. Um, yeah. I think, uh, albums like Pinewood Smile and everything else have been great. Um, yeah. I think they've sort of, they've, it sounds horrible, but because they're not obviously quite and that sort of extreme extravagant point of view where they were, you know, where, you know, um, I believe in a thing called love was getting played all the time and they were mm-hmm. doing headlining all these like huge festivals and everything. I think that's allowed them to be a bit more who they are now. Um, yeah. For a while, I think they might have been chasing it and trying to repeat mm. um, permission to that, whether that be through, you know, record company pressures or whatever. I'm sure there was. Um, and I think they've still continued to have a really good thing, but they just have such a big impact from a re- I mean, this came out, was it 2002, 2003? So this, uh, 2003, this, yeah, this album, came, it? this album came out in 2003. Yeah. So uh, they did the, the 20th anniversary tour, surely. In there. 20 years uh, yeah. ago, this album came out. Um, I mean, so just, like, uh, like, of all the, the new metal and everything else kicking off. And then you've got Justin Hawkins in a cat seat, squealing, squealing away on guitar and going yeah. for a Steven Tyler S scream. And like, you know, I remember people going, oh, this is a novelty act. And I'm like, I don't care. It's great. Mm. I mean, it was for, so- for the, the, the interesting thing is I have also put them at my number six. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For, you know, for the, for these, uh, interesting reasons, the, the, the thing for me is when I was growing up, this was the first rock band of this era that was on mainstream TV, particularly English. Mm. Like we saw the few fires. Yeah. Um, but to have an English rock band go on, Jonathan Ross was pretty unprecedented. You know, like it was like, what's going on here? Like, I remember looking at this and I'm like, they're wearing like almost like 1970s get up. Yeah. Like in kind of like spandex and Lord knows what, uh, and they they're playing, you know, on these kind of chat shows like prime time telly. I was like, I don't get it because like the next week you've got like I don't know Westlife or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know this kind of boy band dominant era. You've got these guys that have suddenly broke through with this massive album, and I've always wondered. I, I was wondering like, what was it? for them like what was that thing that took them in such a short space of time to breaking through into the mainstream audience because to obviously have a successful rock album is something but to get onto like english television as a rock band a period of time where that particular style of rock is actually uncool it's not you know like you've got it wasn't a thing it was literally them on their own yeah it's you know you, it, it was interesting um for me it was a, this weird anomaly um and it kind of i feel this was kind of the moment where at least the english bands started picking up again like the the, the next in this kind of classic rock style yeah um not the new metal stuff none of that like going back to this classic thing. And I think this was this moment. Maybe it was like, hang on a minute, there is a calling for this. People are interested in this kind of thing now. Um, I would be really interested to know, like to maybe even speak to somebody that Absolutely. goes, this this was why. Yeah, this is why it happened. Because like you say, they really were stood out on their own. Yeah, It was not, it was not at a period of time where it was cool to walk around in a cat suit yeah. Um, screaming like Stephen Tyler <laughs> and playing big guitars. Big, mm. two, two, early 2000s, guitar solos were gone. Yeah. Guitar solos were no more um, mm. you know, at that point. No one was doing guitar solos. You know, there's that uh, famous clip, um, if you've ever seen uh, Some Kind of Monster, the Metallica documentary, mm. where they're telling Kirk Hammett on St. Anger, no guitar solos. Yeah. We're not having them. It, you know, this no one's doing them, Kirk. We're not doing them. You know, and Kirk's arguing for a guitar solo. So in a band yeah. like Metallica, who were an established act, and they were telling their lead guitarist, you can't. you're not doing any guitar solos on this record. Yeah. The Darkness came along, an unknown, who were not only paying stuff that was a lot more, you know, hard rock and a lot more generation before Metallica was playing, like sort mm. of the thrash movement. I think every song in the album's got a guitar solo. Yeah. And they became like a signature piece. Like um, 
I believe in a thing called love, probably arguably their biggest single. Yeah. It's got two guitar solos in it. Yeah. You know, Jan, Dan and Justin trading off. And there was this thing, and there was almost this sort of tongue in cheek. And they've always had that kind of humor about this stuff as well, which I like. I like that they don't take themselves too seriously. And arguably, you know, when they, you know, the, one of the last bands to have that kind of explosion, I don't think, I don't think any British band has seen mm. it on that level since. No, I agree. I think in such a short space of time, and that's the thing that's interested me at a point where it's just tremendously uncool and you can't even have a solo. These no. guys are coming along and they're doing all of it. Um, and I feel that, you know, when you look at like even the music videos, they're very kind of self-aware, but they're very retro. Mm. And this is at a point, like obviously now we're seeing a lot of these kind of new bands that are doing retro stuff. You know, they've got like 70s vibes. They've got 80s vibes. They've got all these kind of things going on. And I feel that these guys were the first to kind of do that to go back and be kind of like we're unashamedly like we like acdc we like queen mm. like this is what we like uh we're gonna play this kind of music and we're gonna have fun doing it well even to the point like where like I, i've always been a huge thin lizzie fan right Phil mm, yeah on the base of 13 yeah. i had before the darkness came along i had my classic thin lizzie black t-shirt with the white thin lizzie logo yeah. on it and I remember going down the street wearing it and someone, oh, someone likes the darkness. And I was like, well, I do, but I actually just have a thin lizard because Dan Hawkins sort of legitimately yeah. wore that T-shirt all the time. Yeah. Um, and there was this thing, like, I remember, like, when I bought Permission to Land, like, so I had seen them um, support my dad's friend band, like, because obviously they're from around our area. Um, then the first, like, <laughs> literally it was about a year later, the video for Growing On Me came on, like, Kerrang! TV. And I'm, like, mm. screaming at my dad, going, dad, 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 dad. And my dad comes running into the living room, like, he's like, what, man? And I'm like, isn't that the band that supported Leroy's band? Mm. And he's like, yeah, what are they doing on the telly? You know? And all my family were up in the northeast of England, so we used to go over there in the summer. In the summer, I used to, like, work all, like, Saturday jobs as kids, you know, and then I'd go and have a blowout in the summer with all my money. And I went and bought permission to land. And even my nana, bless, who normally I would bring in a record that I bought, an album. She had no idea who it was. <laughs> when I go, come in, I'm gone. You know, bear, bear in mind at the time prior to that, I'm buying like Slipknot and Limp Biscuit and the Murder Dolls <laughs> and Nine Inch Nails and stuff like that. Yeah. And my nana would just go, oh, that's nice, dear. And, then, you know, yeah. <laughs> she's like looking at like Pretty Hate Machine by Nine Inch Nails going, oh, this looks like a nice album. How wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks, then. And I picked those. I went and I went. She went, what you bought? I was like, I bought The Darkness is New. She went, oh, I've heard them. Wow. See, again. And, just, and it's that moment where you knew it had crossed over into mainstream, yeah. where your nan, who listens to, you know, just the radio. Yeah. Um, and is not interested in the music you listen to <laughs> at all, hasn't probably even got a clue who, you know, Stephen Tyler is, let alone mm. Justin Hawkins, or what you say you would think, um, has, has heard of at least the branding of The Darkness. You know? mm. And it really was a time where they were huge. Like you just, everyone knew about them. And even now to the point where I like, if I go see the darkness now, or I mentioned to people in passing, like, Oh, I was listening to this this morning and like with the last record or whatever. And you get people going, Oh, are they still around. You're like, well, they only stopped for like a few years. Years. Yeah. You know, they're still doing it. They're still, the albums are still arguably just as good. Mm. Um, you know, when I saw them at Rambling Man Fair, they were doing a, um, which was 2015. So I think they were doing like a 15th, was it 15? No, it was 2018. So it was like five years ago. So they were doing like a, a 15th anniversary permission to land set. Mm. And, uh, you know, Justin Linton, uh, Hawkins joked that, you know, we've done other uh, albums since then, but none of you fuckers have bought any of them, you know? Mm. <laughs> and so, I and think, I think the trouble with, um, a few of these bands actually not just the darkness but a few of them mm. they release a debut album that's so good and has mm. made such an impact that you almost can't follow it it's extraordinarily difficult to follow it and uh, you know i, I compare this to the, the guns and roses scenario yeah. you know you release appetite and it's like how do you follow this how do you top this and I think it was the same with, with Permission to Land. Like they had such a, a huge album and so many like singles that were being played over and over again, all over the radio. I put the radio on, and it's, there they were. You know, you put the telly on, there they were. Yeah. Um, and I think I think they they hit 
a pinnacle so quickly. It's like, how do you even retain that? It's just so difficult. It is, man. Mm. Uh, seems as I've mentioned uh, my one. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well uh, move on. My my number five, this was kind of another one that was around this kind of era, this kind of mm. early 2000s period. Uh, so it's the answer. Uh, they were formed in uh, the year 2000 uh, and released their debut album Rise in 2006. Mm. Uh, so again, the same year as Roadstar. Yeah. Which again, I, I feel that it's like, okay, there's a movement here. Something's happening. A couple of years after The Darkness as well. Um, and this, this again was like, oh, this is another band that's kind of, we're moving up again. We're moving up another tier here. I feel that the uh the quality of, of the answer that that first album in particular made such a, a big impact i mean i remember when i was speaking with cormac earlier this year we were talking about them supporting acdc off pretty much off the back of this album yeah like the you know you release a debut album and then so many months later you're supporting acdc i mean that's huge you know um but I felt that that was, again, such a big album and such a, uh, at that period of time, an impactful album that it was very difficult to follow. Um, and yeah, I mean, for me, it was, you know, you got Under the Sky on there, you got loads of great songs and would that are still kind of a staple in their uh, set list now. Of course, they have come back um after a kind of a, a brief hiatus but um yeah they, they they were one of those ones for me as as kind of i was growing up i was like ah here's another one that i that i resonate with that's yeah. new you know they're new they're current but they're bringing this kind of classic rock flavor and again it's like they had this kind of retro feel before that was a thing yeah absolutely you know um so yeah i have to put them in for that that kind of thing there you and me are both are on that level, mate. You know, we, we both love the answer and uh, mm. Sundowners. I've uh, obviously released yeah. that this year. Great record, mm. uh, and yeah, there's no doubt that Rise absolutely had that impact. Like I said, you know, the darkness. The way I'm sort of looking at this is, Jet kind of made me aware that hard rock was still a thing and people were yeah. still. Yeah. The darkness made it acceptable because everyone was mm. listening to it. So you can get away from it. So why not listening to it? And the answer, like I say, the darkness had that kind of kind of faux jokey thing about them. Where they always they weren't a comedic band. They weren't spinal tap, but they always had that sense of humor about it. Mm. Um, and then the answer came along, and then it was like, oh, there's a band that you know, my era that sound like free and Bad mm. Company and Zeppelin all together, and they got this Irish lilt side to it, and it's you know. Yeah, they were the band that made me go just follow this path, and they were probably the first band of this generation of stuff where I was like, "This is my band." Yeah, yeah. If yeah. if it weren't for the fact that I think I believe Roadstar, it was like a few months earlier mm. released that album, but it was these two. I think if <clears throat> I think if the Answer would have released their record before, they'd have been my band. It was it was just one of them. It was like. Oh, whoever was first out the gates you know but it, it it was certainly when i saw them come along as well it was like okay there's there's more than like one or two now mm. something's happening there's a there's a kind of a resurgence i think that was the phrase that was being used it was like the resurgence of mm. classic rock um so yeah i feel that 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 album in particular has to be the one because you know getting a tour with acdc off that <laughs> you know um your number five uh so my number five is um mm. it's, it's the virgin mary's oh yeah for, my god right so you know obviously you usually forget one i forgot the virgin mary's ah, so there that. we go i'm I'm really sorry Alex. <laughs> 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 you, you would have been in my uh in my list at some point i'm not sure where but you'd have been in there um no doubt for the album that lee's going to talk about yeah, I mean, you know, the, the singles they're releasing stuff. We've obviously both spoken to the guys on our respective mm. shows. And, uh, you know, last time I spoke to Ali, you know, they're looking for a full album release next time around, which they're hoping to work on next year. 
Mm. But without a doubt, King of Conflict, it's just one of those albums yeah. where you cannot deny it. You know, they were, um, you know, I remember seeing a, a story of that Toby Jepsen put up. Of course, Toby Jepsen of like, you know, mm. Wayward Sons and everything else that Toby's done over the years. Um, at the time, Toby wasn't in a playing. He was doing more sort of production work. Mm. And he was sort of, uh, by his own words, I think he'd fallen out of love with the music scene a little bit and was just focused on the production work and that kind of thing. And a friend of his had seen the Virgin Mary somewhere along the line um, and said to him, like, I've just found, I think the phrase he used, I've just seen, I've just found Led Zeppelin, but for now, mm. like, this is this generation's Led Zeppelin. This is right, how right. good these guys are. They don't sound like Led Zeppelin, but this is how much of an impact they're going to have, sort of thing. Mm. And uh, Toby's like, okay. So the next time they played, they, you know, he's made when took him down and was like, and he said, like, they went into this, you know, rising kind of venue where there was, you know, not huge, huge venue by any means. And hardly anyone was there as it is the case in your early gigs and that. And, um, you know, the boys still absolutely played it like they were playing Wembley or whatever, you know, and that's what captured Toby. And that's why he's like, I want to work with these guys. These guys, have, you know, they've got passion and they mean what they're putting out there. So I want to do it. And he, he was the one who produced King of Conflict. And, you know, mm. I remember like like a lot of people, um, it was a case of, you know, Slash got hold of them yeah. and yeah. put them out there. And, you know, they had the back end of Slash and what have you. And it suddenly, you know, they, they, they was just this huge thing. And I remember like going to Download Festival, I think it was just before King of Conflict came out. Mm. And um, I'd heard the name, but I hadn't heard them. Um, my mate had caught them supporting someone. I can't remember who he caught them supporting now, but he was like, you know, you need to come in the tent with me now. Like, you need to come and because they're playing in the in the third stage in the tent. And they're like, you need to come with me now. Like, you're not missing these. I'm like, okay, if you feel that bad <laughs> solidly about it, I'll come with you. And I walked in and I was just like, whoa. Like, absolutely hit me with a wall. And for a long time, they were that band. They were mm. the band that were going to break it. They were going to go and do these huge, huge things. And to, you know, they, they have. They've gone and done them. You know, they've gone and done them. They face adversity. You know, they're now down to, to two picks between Ali and, and Danny. Um, obviously started off as a trio. And I think it's a testament, especially to that release, that this year they've done their anniversary shows for King Conflict. Mm. And you couldn't get a ticket for Love No Money. Yeah, they just they did like I think it was I think it started for one and they did two possibly three. Um, I can't remember. It wasn't many. They had like literally two or three shows, and I desperately wanted to go. <laughs> I, I couldn't get a ticket for anything, you know. <laughs> and it, I just think that just shows just how much of an impact that record had. They're that many because they brung back um, their bass player. You know, they brung mm -hmm. him back for these shows, and it was just like everyone of my generation wanted to go watch it. And yeah, they're yeah. playing these small, smaller shows um, for it to make it more intimate and make a thing. And I've seen them since, and they've always got that fire about them live. I think they've had such a huge impact. I remember, um, I'm going to name drop now, so I'm sorry. Go for it. <laughs> but <laughs> I was um, at the Stone Free Festival, thanks to Joe's brother, because he was um, um, playing in an Alice Cooper. Sorry, Alice Cooper was headlining. He was playing in an ACDC tribute band who were doing the after party at the Stone Free Festival. So he was playing in the Indigo room where some of the other bands were playing, not in the main stage. Mm. On the Indigo stage, the Virgin Marys were also playing. But also later on in that day, Michael Monroe had been playing. Right? Mm. So when I was backstage waiting for James to come off so I could help him with his drums, me mm. and Joe's dad got chatting to Michael Monroe, right? And the first thing after sort of hello, how are you kind of thing that Michael Monroe says to us is, did you watch the Virgin Marys earlier? Mm. And I was like, yeah, we did. They're really good. I love them. And we got talking about King of Conflict because it was probably only sort of three years old at that time. Mm. Um, and we were talking about all of that. And, you know, you said that he goes, that's the first thing Michael Monroe came out with. Please tell me you watched The Virgin Mary's. Early. I love them. I love Bang Bang. It's a great song. You know, I love that album. And we were talking about it. And then uh, years later, so anyway, it was about a year ago, I got to interview Michael Monroe for, for my radio show. And we were chatting like we, me and you do, you know, before we sort of hit record. Mm. And he sort of looks at me and he's like, have we have we met before, man? I've, I've recognised, I sort of recognised. And I sort of go, yeah, well, we met very briefly, you know, at this thing. And he went, that's right, we were talking about the Virgin Marys, weren't we? And I was like, uh, yeah. And that was like, mm. you know, sort of seven, eight years ago now. 
And I think when they have the backing of people like that, I mean, don't get me wrong, you don't need big names to make a big impact necessarily. But I think when the bands who are already of that generation previous, where they've made their name, they've made their successes, and they don't have to give anyone any credit, Mm. they don't have to shine a light on anyone new, they just go, but they do because they've made such an impact that they've made, you know, this for one of a better term senior peers stand up and pay attention mm. and go jesus who's these guys you know i've got to put them in i just have to and you know i hadn't seen them for maybe a year or so and um from when they were three piece now it was like a year like we're saying and they were playing at the apex here in barry they were supporting a new model army and i'll be honest i don't mind new model army it was a good good, good show really enjoyed it but i was really excited for virgin mary's because i hadn't seen them in some time and we went down, me and my mate Daryl, and they just absolutely blew it out of the water. Mm. Absolutely. And you think going from three to two, are you going to have that same kind of impact, that ferocity, because you haven't got a bass player thickening up the sound anymore? It wasn't missing at all. And I'm a bass player, so I look an elf. <laughs> if there's no bass guitar on stage, I'm like, oh, it's going to sound thin. It's going to sound rubbish. It's not going to be right. But it did. It sounded absolutely storming. And I just think they had that impact. And... I hope they continue to do so. You know, every time they sort of bring around a single and I play it on the radio show or I'm just chatting to people generally about it, it's always a talking point. You know, there's still moments like we will talk. I remember me and my mates talking about, we were talking about this, you know, like when we were sort of 17 to sort of 19, 20. So our dads had paranoid. They had made him rock. You know, they had... Toys in the Attic, they had, you know, Pinball Wizard. They had all these great, great albums that are now redeemed classics. Hmm. What of this generation would you think would be deemed a classic album in 20, 30 years? And all hmm. of us said King of Conflict. We just didn't see how it wouldn't transcend into now. I mean, like you, like we say, they've been doing the anniversary shows Obviously, I was speaking to Ali, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to have to dig out King. I spoke to Ali, and we were listening, talking about those singles, obviously the new single they, had, they just had out and everything else. And I thought, no, I'm going to have to dig out King of Conflict. I've not listened to that for a while. And yet again, like when I was sort of 19, 20, when I first clocked it, it was like my foot's going down on the accelerator of my car. <laughs> like It just has an impact where you're just like, yeah. And it still has that, man. And I think they still have that life, absolutely. So, yeah, they're, they're my number my number five. I think that they're they're one of the ones for me that's an anomaly. Like I feel that, um, as you said, there you know you've had people like Slash and mm. uh, people like that rave about them, and for whatever reason, after that album, it just hasn't quite no. kicked on. And I, we don't know. I don't know why. Because I mean, they released that EP last year. Great EP, great EP. I mean, we we decided um, in last year's episode, you know, the Beyond the Vibe Awards, mm. uh, we gave it like best EP of the year, um, and it's you know again, it's like there's so many they they just keep putting out great songs, really really good material, yeah, um, and it's it's really well written, mm. um, very kind of clever writing, um. Yeah, they they're a band for me that are just like they would go in an underrated category as well. Mm. Like I I just I feel that I don't know what it is, but you know maybe maybe they need like the right person to find them again. Yeah, maybe you know it's something like that. But um, yeah, certainly the quality is there for sure. Absolutely. Uh, my number four. So we're, we're getting closer. Uh, I'm coming in with the the only super group in my uh, my kind of top ten. So I'm going with the Raconteurs. Oh, good call! Cool. Exactly, because because obviously cool. we can't have the White Stripes because they. Yeah, uh, I looked at Elephant, but I was like, oh, I can't. Yeah. Have... But I really it's... did want Elephant in there. Yeah, I mean it's it's a tough one because again, the White Stripes through those two thousands were such a huge thing. But I would certainly say that the raconteurs, that you, you know, they kind of made their own thing. They, you know, obviously we had Jack White. Yeah, we had Jack White in there, but it was kind of a coincidental thing that he was there, really, because it was a different flavor, different dynamic. 
Uh, I mean, they formed back in 2005. So again, it's linked to this whole movement that's happening. Um, and to have Jack White kind of jump in on that, who I felt at the time was kind of a, a real front runner. And again, he, he went in on with this band in particular. It was kind of a retro feel. Hmm. Um, so again, it joins that list of growing bands there. Uh, I mean, for me, I felt that, you know, their second album, everybody kind of cites that debut as being the one, but I don't know. I felt that they, like they did, uh, on the second one, they did a cover of, um, rich kid blues, you know, Terry Reed. They did. Yeah. And that's a great cover. And Mm -hmm. like a lot of, a lot of people kind of my age and, you know, um, perhaps a bit older, they wouldn't know who Terry Reed is. No. Uh, it's a bit of a niche choice. Um, and I think that it kind of, it was great to hear that song, like their version of that song. Um, I think it gave it this kind of new lease of life. And, you know, maybe for some others, it, you know, helped them discover Terry Reed, who I think is great. Oh, yeah. uh, really underrated. But, um, yeah, there, there was lots of stuff in there. And I think that, this second album was the one where it's like we're starting to see this kind of variety that we're seeing from Jack White now. Yeah. Like we're seeing these different flavors. I mean, I feel that their best album wasn't way later until 2019 with okay. uh, Help Me Stranger. That's oh, yeah. their latest record. I think this, that new album, which kind of links into this new era now. Is is the one that's so underrated, at least in this country. I don't know what it's like in America. People in America may go, "Oh, but it was everywhere." Um, it didn't really do anything over here. No, it wasn't um, a big. No, it was a strange one, but it was my album of the year at the time. Um, and I think that it, again, it's this kind of classic feel, but for a modern era, and it's done really, really well. Really great, like writing in it. It's got everything. But I think that this kind of group of, of of guys they've they've come from like different bands haven't they like there are lots of different ones a few that i'm not not as familiar with but um yeah they, they really work well and you know that that first era as well i mean i'm sure everybody remembers steady as she goes i mean that was such a big hit at the time um so i felt that i kind of had to include these guys for that because i mean i remember that music video being everywhere you can get away from it it was absolutely yeah. everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, uh, for that reason, I felt that they had to be in this kind of top four because they're still here now and they're still Mm. doing something different now. It's like they've evolved to this next tier, um, as Jack White has himself, uh, in my opinion, anyway. Um, So, yeah, that's my my number four. I'm glad you included that, man, because I think both – with any project he's been involved in and on his solo side of things. Mm. Um, I think Jack White does get overlooked these days. I think he has been put in that category of, oh, he was in the White Stripes. But, and yeah, like I say, I wanted to put Elephant in, you know, because yeah. it's such a huge record. And again, it was of that era, similar to like Jet, who I mentioned earlier, who was when everyone was doing the new metal thing. He had, you mm. know, White Stripes come along with like Garage Rock, essentially, and it being like, oh, okay, well, this is still cool. You know, it was a similar kind of vibe thing with Jet. Um, but the last two albums, the two albums he brought out last year was Storman. Mm. Very different from each other. Yeah. Very different from each other. I mean, one was almost trancy, mm. uh, but equally brilliant. And uh, yeah, so well played there, man. It's, it, it felt like they they needed to be included, not just because of Jack White, but as this group, it was, you know, as I say, I feel that they were doing this kind of retro thing again, but in a different way, you know, it wasn't like the darkness. It wasn't like the answer. It was in a different feel. Um, and it was like a, an amalgamation of various different things, but for this new era and they made this kind of thing cool, you know, it was on like, you know, music stations. It was on, you know, like, like music videos are being played all the time and, you know jack white was kind of the cool guy wasn't he oh, yeah. in that era in particular um so he made kind of that that kind of raw feel you know like it's not really polished in an era where everything was kind of going digital yeah um you know he was going actually i'm going to go the other way 
So he went completely away, didn't he? He was the one yeah. of the first to really start recording on tape again and uh, mm. old analog systems and everything else. Yeah, and this is it. I mean, I know that they they shot one of the the music videos on like old film and stuff like that. They were deliberately going the other way when everybody was going digital. And, you know, we're seeing more of that now. But yeah. they were doing it years ago. <laughs> so I felt that they had to be in for that. So my next one is um, is Blackstone Cherry. Mm. Um, I'll be honest with you, these next four on it's a flip tough, of a coin, it? it's tough, on a flip of a coin could kind of been in any order. Um, but Blackstone Cherry, man, where do I start? You know, they just, they really, you know, I, by that point, what, 2007, the first album came out, um, so, yeah, they well, their debut, I believe it or not, was in two thousand and six. Wow! So it was around the same year as the end. So then, see, in my head, it was closer. And then I was thinking, I was like, no, because I saw them at Download that year. Um, but when I think about it, yeah, it would have been because I saw them first time. I saw them. Uh, they were it was at Hyde Park at Aerosmith, summer two thousand and seven. It was their first UK show, mm. um, but they were playing the tent. They weren't on the main stage of Aerosmith, and there was a gap somewhere on the day and i can't remember why or who it was but i, I just on the flip of a coin kind of went to my dad it was me and my dad who went down yeah i'm gonna go in that tent and see who's over there and he's like oh man we'll, i'll come with you so mm. we went into the tent didn't know who we were going to be greeted by uh we just weren't particularly enamored with whoever was on the on the main stage at the time i can't remember who it was um it's like an all day thing obviously and we walked in and we were greeted with you know for Kentucky lads, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah. and they were there, and it was obviously, it was, you know, my dad loved Skinhead, so he instantly fell in love with that southern rock side of their sound. Mm. And it was, it was, it was that thing that kind of, you know, it reminded me of my childhood, but it was heavier and it was raw and it was meant for our year. And, you know, I was still watching them, and they were played like they were playing, you know, just before Aerosmith or whatever, and they, they were absolutely on another level. And, uh, and then I didn't see him for, for quite a while, maybe about a year. Mm. And um, I was, me and my friends had gone to um, an answer gig and missed the last train home, basically, from Camden to Norwich. Uh, so, uh, which is sort of the round the rise era of the answer. So it was pretty early on. Mm. And we missed the train back to, to back to Norwich where we were living. So we had to kind of like wander around Camden until about five, six in the morning when we could get a train or at least get the tube back to Liverpool Street and then wait for a, a train. And uh, we're walking over. We saw the poster for Blackstone Cherry at this story. And uh, we just decided, right, we're coming back next week and we'll go watch them. And we did. And, you know, the album by this point had come out, a debut. And it was one of the ones where, like, like I said, my dad had seen them with me supporting Aerosmith, and I got quite a lot of albums for for that particular Christmas, as I often did because my family know I love my music, so it was always a, a lot of albums for Christmas and stuff. And dad, had, or mum and dad, but obviously he'd come from my dad because he'd seen them sort of thing, had bought me the the Davy Blackstone Cherry album, and it was that thing where I was like, oh, that's cool. And then you know you get busy at Christmas, you don't listen to things, whatever. And I'd gone back to uni and I put it on to, as a thing to like, I'll put that on while I'm doing some work. And I had to stop the assignment I was doing because after an hour, I realised I wasn't paying any attention to it anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd just been sat in there going, you know, Rain Wizard came on and mm. Only Train came on and, you know, Hell or High Water was coming through the speakers and everything else on that record. And I was just like, holy shit, this is amazing. This is a fantastic record. And from what I'm hearing from... The more recent album, the last album, the new album, I should say, um, yeah. you know, it sounds like they've gone back to that more heavier sound because they went kind of more southern on certain records and a little lighter in mm -hmm. places. And I really miss that kind of rarity and that kind of ferocity about them. And I feel like they've really got it again on this new album. Um, I know you spoke to Chris recently, obviously, and you were speaking about all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, they made such a big impact and they were like the they went from because the answer kind of went quiet for a little while while they were supporting acdc because they were on the road for so long with acdc it was about mm. a ticket tour or something so like within that period there was quite a big gap between album two and three mm. um and it was that thing where like blackstone cherry was sort of filling that gap almost for me while the answer were you know on tour naturally you know with acdc who's going to turn down that tour? Yeah. um and we came at the right time and it was just phenomenal 
Mm. And they really seemed to be a thing where like everybody who was liking that hard with everyone loved Blackstone Cherry. Mm. You know, I used to, uh, you know, I was just starting to, I remember the first night I played, I went, I was DJing, I used to DJ a couple of rock bars and stuff in Norwich on Saturday nights and that. And I threw on Lonely Train and the place went berserk. Mm. And it was that moment. And, it, you know, the album hadn't been out that long, maybe a month or something. And it wasn't like, you you know, when you throw on a classic, like you throw on Walk This Way or you throw on, mm. you know, Highway Star or something and everyone goes bananas because everyone knows it. But, you know, Lonely mm. Train went on. And it wasn't just like, oh, this is a cool riff. People were like drunk, obviously, because they're at a bar or whatever. But, you know, people are singing away and you're like, okay, there's something here. Yeah. Because these people are singing with as much passion to Lonely Train as they're doing the aforementioned Walk This Way and Paranoid or whatever else I was playing. And they made such a big impact that, especially I feel like on the first two albums, particularly, yeah. I mean, I have all the records, but I feel like the first two, uh, you know, the debut in Folklore and Superstition. And then I think Folklore and Superstition, they've definitely expanded their style with, with stuff like, you know, Peace is Free. And, I mm. mean, that's just a beautiful song. Um, and, you know, again, they've gone from like seeing them at the Astoria and Norwich UEA and the waterfront and, you know, the tents and things to being main stage headliners at Rambling Man Fair, second stage headliners at Download Festival, seeing them at Wembley Arena. They play the Albert Hall. Yeah. You know, they're going they they, they are at that at that level. They're absolutely mm. at that level. And like they have to be up there. And mm. like I can say on the flip of a coin, these next four bands could easily rotate. It was really, really tricky. It um, it was interesting when I was speaking with Chris, it it was as if those first two records in particular it was it it obviously made an impact on them as well okay which was an interesting thing because yeah. when they were talk when he was talking about the new record he was like i loved like this is chris he was like i loved the rawness of those first that first album i love the the energy i love uh, and and we kind of but the thing which really made me go wow you know these that debut and and and, the, and its follow-up was so impactful was he goes we want to go back towards that oh. like he was like this is what we want again mm. you know obviously they're gonna you know move it forward and it's not going to be a rehash but they 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 wanted that feel again yeah. so sort of sonical vibe about it yeah, they, you know, they wanted the rawness back. They wanted that kind of punch that those first like two got, albums had. I really hmm? do. I feel like they've got it with this new album. I really, I, do. I believe they do. Um, you know, there was a, there's an energy there again, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, obviously a lot of people they enjoyed those other records that have come out since, and uh, I know that they their third album was, I believe that was technically their most successful. Oh, between they really, the and the deep blue sea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that really kind of broke through a lot. But um, yeah, tracks like you know White Trash Millionaire on it and all that. Yeah. Really. Um, but it was it was interesting to hear from from Chris himself. He was like those those first two, like those mm -hmm. are the ones. And it was it was like okay, this is like it's definitely made such an impact that it's actually impacted the band. Yeah, that they look back on it and they go oh we should do that or something yeah. in this vein. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, my, uh, my number three. So we're getting into the top three. So any of these top three for me personally could be number one. Uh, it's such a, a tough thing, but uh, my number three, I've gone with rival sons. Many would think, oh, that's going to be Ryan's number one choice. Uh, obviously, they were they were formed uh, back in 2009. Yeah. Um, they're kind of, I feel their real breakthrough was their, their second album, Pressure and Time, which came out in uh, 2011. You know, such a, an impactful thing. I remember that the, the single, you know, the music video for Pressure and Time. I, I remember first seeing that. And I was like, ooh, you know, this is, again, this is like, just at a point where I felt maybe things are fading away again. Yeah. These guys come along and it's it's like, ooh, this has got a different flavour, but it's it's got these classic elements that I really like. 
Um, and Scott, you know, Scott's guitar work is is so at that period of time, it's so different to anybody else. You know, he's playing a, a Firebird at the time, and nobody's playing a Firebird. Um, you know, it was almost kind of an uncool guitar to have. Um, but he made it cool. You know, now now you're seeing, you know, what I talked about earlier with the uh, a, a band's impact is when you see other bands that are trying yeah. similar recipes. You know, they're, they're they're doing similar things, and we're seeing that now. I mean, an ongoing joke on 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 the podcast is when I asked that question of, uh, you know, who would you tour with? You know, a band of today. So many have said Rival Sons. It's unbelievable. Um, you know, particularly these upcoming bands, and it just shows that impact and a lot of sighting pressure and time. Yeah. You know, um, perhaps because they were growing up during that era, and you know, that's that's the one that kind of really did it for them um looking from a critical standpoint though in terms of the albums i would actually go with dark fire for this year that's mm. the obviously they're one of their newest records obviously they went with two albums this year okay. um but i feel dark fire is the one uh for me that's kind of um just such an accomplished album i think that they've really matured and um I think that they're this kind of full, complete band, um, particularly with these these two records. But if I'm going to pick one, I'm going to say Dark Fire. And I think that, you know, this shows something for me with Rival Sons, and this is why they have to be in my top three. With each album, I think they've got better. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's interesting that, because, I mean, we're, we're saying with a lot of these other bands it's like oh you know they released this debut album and that was amazing but how do you come back from there how do you you know how do you like top that i don't know how they keep topping it but exactly yeah they really do i mean i felt a few years ago that perhaps they'd reached the pinnacle with fell roots Mm. i felt that you know fell roots is such a great album i thought the Um, same about great western valkyrie and then i was proven wrong Hollow Bones mm. was a bit more of a grower. Um, yep. It took me a little more to get my head into than some mm. of the records. I do think it's a very much an underrated record, Hollow Bones. Um, mm. But when Feral Roots came out, I again went, they definitely can't top this. They just definitely yeah. can't. And now they've come out with Dark Fire and Lightbringer, and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know where they're pulling it from out from the bag from, but mm. they do, and they are. I feel that in particular, having spoke when when I spoke with Scott recently, I feel their thing when he mentioned he goes every time we go into the recording studio, mm. he was like, "I use new equipment, I use new things, and we look at like a new approach." And I think maybe, maybe because they're every time they're looking at rather than going oh, this was popular, we're going to do either more of this or we're going to, you know, kind of even just elaborate on that. They're going, what can we do that's different? And it still feels like Rival Sons, of course, but each time there's something different that they they haven't done before. Um, You know, when I think of each album, there's something in there at some point that... um, that's got a different flavor. I mean, even, you know, with Lightbringer, their opening track, Dark Fighter, it's like, uh, what is it? Eight and a half minutes. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's nearly nine minutes long, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, you know, they haven't done that before and they had this acoustic opening and it was like, this feels different. And this is like your, what is it? Ninth, ninth album. Ninth album now. Yeah. Um, and so to still be doing things, you know, nine albums deep and, and having this kind of fresh feel, um, it's that innovation for me that that means they have to be in this list, and they've mm-hmm. crossed over, I think, to the to be kind of the 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 spiritual part of this new wave of classic rock. Because so many are saying, "Oh, Rival Sons are the band that's kind of influenced me." Rival Sons mm-hmm. are the one, and I think in the, the, they're slightly underrated as well. I feel because you know you look at bands like. Uh, Greta Van Fleet now that have kind of really quickly ascended and they're playing like uh, I know in America they're playing like you know arenas and 
yeah. big places like that. And I, I do feel that, no discredit to Greta Van Fleet at all, but I do feel that Rival Sun should be that band. I don't know why they're not quite getting to the, what I would class as the arena level. Yeah. Um, because I know a lot of people thought when they went and toured with Sabbath mm. and, you know, they were getting great reviews for that and obviously sold out crowds for Sabbath with it being Sabbath's final yeah, yeah. farewell tour for 13 and all that. Mm. That, um, you know, I think people would have thought that's it. They're going to do the arenas. Yeah. And, and they're not, I don't know why they're not. Mm. Um, on a selfish point of view, I'm glad they're not. Same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't go wrong. Arena shows and stadium shows are fun. If you're in the first mm. couple of rows, if you're yeah. halfway back, you kind of lose it a bit. Yeah, Unless you're watching a band like Maiden, where you get the kind of theatrical aspect of, mm. of a more of a, a stage show on that kind of level. You know, someone like that maybe is different. Mm. But for a band like Rival Sons, who are their stage show is them. You know, mm. obviously I watched them Friday, and it's like, you know, you got four front men up there. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's none of them that are stagnant or boring live, um, and. Yeah, so I don't know. And on a selfish level, I'm, I'm glad that they're not doing stadiums and stuff. Yep. I think, it, you know, like I said, in the first couple of rows, you you would lose that magic a little bit like you you do you do on a, on a big mm. compared I'm, to that. I'm of that, yeah. I've, been, I've never been much of a stadium guy, but I, I just feel that, they you know, I'm looking... Up there, though. They should yeah, I'm, I'm looking at these, you know, these bands that are around at the minute, and I'm like, I feel Rival Sun should be there. Mm. you Absolutely. know um so yeah that's uh that's my number three. three your uh is it number three yeah my number three mate yeah so your number three um is is old bridge oh that's a good choice um uh, yeah you know um but i think again they came out first down 2004 one day certainly, certainly around that time and again it's like that kind of 04 yeah. to 06 era and you know yeah because i saw him at download 2005 was the first time i saw him. i think the album had been out just under a year mm. and you know obviously everyone knows they formed from the ashes of creed and mm. it was that moment where like i liked creed but creed were and i think it's fair to say i'm not, I'm not going to slag any creed fans off i was one right i liked mm. creed but creed were definitely a marmite band right mm. you liked creed or you didn't like them at all uh, you know, there was no kind of someone who went, oh, they're all right. You know, it was either you, you like you, you were in camp or you're out of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, they split. Scott Stapp went to go on to do his own thing. Uh, the rest of those guys formed Old Bridge with this then unknown singer, mm. uh, i.e. Mr. Miles Kennedy. And I bought uh, the first album, One Day Remains, because I liked Creed. Oh, I'll see what those guys are doing now. I'll go by this. Mm. And I, it came on, and <laughs> from the moment it kicked in, and Miles' voice comes over the speakers, I was like, "Where do they find this guy?" Because mm. I think Scott Stapp's got a great voice. Don't get me wrong, brilliant vocalist, but Miles is on another level. Yeah. Um, and it opens up with "Find the Real," and he comes over with that big hanging out, that big note halfway through "Find the Real," and it was like. Whoa. And um like I say they were when I saw them at download, that, that at that point they were the band a bit like when I heard Pressure in Time for the first time, where you talk mm. about Rob Sunset, where I just got so enamored with this record. Like like mm. I could I couldn't listen to it enough. I couldn't soak up enough, you know, I'd you know, practically trying to wring the thing out, trying to get more <laughs> out of it, you know. Um and they were about halfway up the bill, so sort of like late afternoon kind of time. Mm. My friend was, we were all going, it was our first download all together. We were like 17, you know, first, first festival for me away from my dad and all that kind of thing. And we we're all excited. And my mate was like, oh, you know, we're sitting there in college, you know, who are you looking forward to seeing? I'm really looking forward to seeing Oldbridge. And he's like, I don't like Creed, man. I don't like Creed. And I was like, ignore the fact it was Creed and come watch them. And he wouldn't. He's like, no, 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 no. Anyway, I made, I literally made him borrow the album. I was like, right, just listen to this. And I just annoyed him until he borrowed it. 
the next day he came and he went, I listened to that album. I went, all right, what did you think? He went, when, what time are they on? Mm. <laughs> you know, there was something there. And I felt it the first time I watched them. And then the next time I watched, saw them was the following year down like 2006. They went, they, they went from like middle of the day on the main stage to headline in the second stage in one year. Mm-hmm. And that was like, oh, okay, <laughs> something's going on. And it was just before they released the Blackbird album, which for me is still their pinnacle on, on record. I don't mm-hmm. think you can, it's one of those albums where you, I don't think you could ever beat it. They've come very close on other records and I love all their albums. But I remember them, They it wasn't quite out yet, so they did two songs off of it. They did Brand New Start and they did Blackbird, the title track. Mm-hmm. And I remember when they came out of that live and it was the first time they played it in front of an English audience. And the whole, because Download Festival, second stage used to be like a big marquee at that point. It was before the second stage went outside. And everyone in that tent was just stood there like looking like they were about to burst into tears because no one was expecting this to come out. And they're just one of those bands that keep constantly pushing it and it both individually as well. You know, Miles goes off and no one really knows, you know, he's still on that kind of underground culty level at this point where you know Miles from Alter Bridge. Then he goes and does like that first Slash record mm. and guests on two songs on that, like Back From Cali and, and um, you know, the other track he guested on. And so then Slash goes, right, I'm going on the road and of all the vocalists I know, and all the singers that went on this album, I'm going to take out Miles Kennedy to do the whole thing because he's the only one who can do everything. And you're like, okay. Mm-hmm. And then he goes and releases, you know, the um, look um, Year of the Tiger album and the last album that he released on the side of the It's just going bigger and bigger and bigger. And they've gone from, like I say, middle of the stage of, uh, you know, middle of the day, Download Festival 2005 to headline in May 2006 to sub headline in the main stages of Download to Wembley, to back to the Albert Hall I were talking about, Blackstone Cherry. And mm. they're constantly building it and they're constantly build- And the amount of times I've been at a festival and seen the Blackbird tattooed on someone. And that's always a sign for me. When it, when an emblem becomes that iconic, mm. that people, and it's not just like a couple of cool hardcore fans who are like, I really love this album. It means something personal to me. I'm going to get the Blackbird. I'm sure everyone's got it. I mean, I'm speaking with a male load of fucking tattoos. I don't, <laughs> I don't get them done willy nilly. You know, you know, there's Jesus. If I had a tattoo of um, every band that I loved, you wouldn't be able to see my eyes. But yeah. you know, everyone gets the tattoos done for a reason. But when you see like you're at a festival, not like even an old which gig, just at a festival, and you see people with a you know blackbird back piece, or they've got it on their chest, or they've got it on their or on the back of their leg, wherever it is, you just see it, and it's a sea of like this is an army of people who just believe in this band so much. Mm. that they're willing to put an emblem of that band onto their body. And I know some people don't think it's tattoos as deeply as others, um, but when you've got that, it's like, that's insane. It mm. is literally insane. And they did the, you know, they've done the Royal Out Hall with a big Philharmonic Orchestra and all that kind of thing. And I was, I'd, I'd have loved to have been in that because I bet that was absolutely epic. And they're another band that when I'm talking to people on the radio show or just friends, mm. generally, they're a band that keep get cited as influencers. Mm. They're a band that keep getting cited, and it's normally Blackbird that gets a mention as an album, you know. And they wrote great, wrote great some great like Fortress was a great record. Uh, AB3 was fantastic, you know. They uh, the last record they released last year was brilliant. You know, they've wrote consistently really good albums. And when like, me and my friends, I'm sure lots of people do this as well. They'll go like, you know, not only like. Who would you guess would be headlining Download next year, for example? Mm. Who do you think should do it? Like, who should have done it by now? And one band that consistently comes up in conversations of, like, why have they not done it yet? Why have they not headlined? Mm. Is also a band that I've heard people like Andy Coppin and other big festival organisers go, I'd like to get them to do it. And it's all a bridge. Mm. You know, I mean, I actually got Just Push Play, which is a nowhere near the scale of Download, and I'm not going to say it is. <laughs> It's nothing compared to it. Why don't you book Alter Bridge, Lee? <laughs> I did ask someone asked me once why I haven't booked Alice Cooper yet because I'm a big yes. Alice Cooper fan. I'm like, yeah, sponsor the, sponsor me to do it and I'll try. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I know, I like, said, so this isn't going to go Andy Coppin because I know what it's like. You know, there's a million and one logistical reasons why mm. you do not get a band and it's not because you don't like them most of the time. 
most of the time it's touring it's logistics they're booked on another show they're in the recording studio they're on this tour with someone else that the other side of the world how do i get them back and it doesn't work out right mm. but just the fact that they are consistently a band that are mentioned of people who should be headlining yeah. they should be headlining download by now you know we're talking like say 2004 so you're talking 20 years next year since mm. And they've not headlined download. I mean, who knows? Andy Coppins announcing November um, download lineup. Maybe by then it'll be announced, and it might be all because he has mentioned them before. Um, I'm I'm not to say I'm not to anyone to say how a man runs his festival and he runs it as successful as download. You know, that's not what I'm trying to say. All I'm saying is that they are a band that consistently I see in polls get mentioned for newer mm. bands that should be headlining these types of festivals. And I've seen Andy Coppin and other festival directors of that nature mention that they these would be the kind of band they'd be looking at. And when they're having that impact on not only the festivals in terms of fans going, we want them to do it, but the yeah. you know, the organizers are looking at them and they're impacting this whole new generation of bands. It's just got to go up there. They just have to go up there for me for this that first sort of wave. My number two. So uh it's yeah, the no. one that missed out on the top spot. Uh, and it's one that you've mentioned earlier, way Ooh. earlier. Um, but I feel that I have to put these guys in, and and we know that they only really they only really had one album that kind of blew up to the degree that it did. But then again, quite a lot do off this off this uh, top ten. So I am going with Wolf Mother. Uh, yeah, see, I'm throwing it in there, and there is a reason. Obviously, uh, Wolf Mother formed in 2004, and the self titled release was 2005, so just a year later. For me, I don't know whether you can remember Guitar Hero, yes, yeah, yeah. obviously, that was a big, big thing. Massive Wolf Mother released their debut album, and in a short space of time, they got their single, which was everywhere, just called Woman. Yes, uh, and that made it onto Guitar Hero, and I remember very distinctively because a lot of the bands at that period of time for me, it was like I was liking these bands, but a load of kids at school they didn't know who the hell they were. Yeah. Now I say one day they they're like, oh, who you who you into? You know all this kind of thing. Oh, some like weirdo band, uh, and I'm like, oh, I like Wolf Mother, and they were like, oh you know the one the one off guitar hero yeah. so it's like okay so they're already kind of breaking through and this is off one album uh they're getting that single played on the radio as well and it's like okay so they're getting close um you know around that time obviously we, we spoke about you know the darkness were kind of around and and uh but I, I think just a little bit lower a few tears lower you had like wolf mother there mm. um you know, obviously, the, it was very difficult to follow that album up. But I, I very much remember that they had like a big, big tour off the back of this album. It was like a huge world tour or something. Um, and they, they were getting like big, uh, like real big kind of uh, nigh on arena levels in some countries. Mm. And this is off one album, um, which I found really interesting. But for me, it was like, they hit a balance or, you know, maybe Andrew, Andrew Stock, the other kind of, the guy that's kind of really spearheaded it, hit this balance between retro and modern. And it felt really retro, like more so perhaps than the answer and, and road star and that. And it, but it was like, he really embraced it. And I don't know, there was something about it that was like, this is different to everything else at that period of time there's nothing quite like these guys right now i mean obviously we you know we have a bit of like black sabbath in there we have a bit of like led zeppelin in there we have a bit of this that and the other but they had a, a very distinctive style i mean when i hear them it's like you know who they are straight away but the fact that we were getting kind of what i would class as a mainstream audience starting to recognize who they were I mean, obviously that did fade away after a period, but there was this window of a few years where people knew who they were. And it was interesting that 
a, a games company who you know made Guitar Hero, and that kind of became a thing. Yeah, it's huge. They thing. they had them as kind of one of the new bands to have in their kind of roster in amongst all of these other kind of well-known ones. I believe, you know, they had like Slash at one point and they had, you know, all these different kind of real well-known icons. Uh, You know, they had, I I, I vaguely recall they had like Smoke on the Water next to the Wolf Mother track. And it's it's interesting that, you know, they're, they're pairing these things together and, you know, I feel that they and others felt that they were going to be that next big band. It was definitely that anticipation about them, especially around the time of that record. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, it was difficult following that, but I, I just felt for this, for that scene at that period of time, it, it really kind of broke through and kind of pushed this particular style back. Cause as, as again, we spoke about, you know, it didn't play, solos we didn't do this we didn't do that and you know he was using like retro gear and he was using like stuff that at the time is not particularly very cool um even like his titles the titles of his songs like there was one that was like uh tales from the forests of gnomes and it's like if you release that in that era uh it's like that that just shouldn't work no, not in that time. You know, this is in the same era of like Limp Biscuit and like, you know, people that are playing something completely different. Uh, yet they managed to kind of find this way to, to get success in such a short period of time. Um, and that's always fascinated me. The bands that just come from nowhere and just become like this kind of mega hit thing almost overnight. Um so for that reason, I felt it had to be kind of in there. And it was one of them that just kind of kept creeping up the list because I was like, you know what? I really enjoy this album. It's a really good record. Yeah. Like, I know that, you know, the subsequent records aren't, you know, at the same level. But there's something about that debut album. And I think now it's weirdly become kind of this almost forgotten album. I remember... I said to somebody ages ago, I can't remember who it was, but I said to somebody ages ago about Wolf Mother, and they were like, oh, I remember them. Like, are they still around? Like, yeah. people don't, people, you know, it's kind of this vague memory from this period of time. Um, So, yeah, I want to throw it back out there. I mean, believe it or not, they are still around today um, doing stuff. But, um, yeah, that debut album is the one where it's like, that's pretty much most of their set list, I believe, at this point. So again, it shows the impact. What's uh, Lee's number two? We're getting so close. Really close, mate. Mm. Really close. As you know, it's uh, it's tricky now. I don't mm. like it. <laughs> I've got, I'm always excited when you go, should we do another one of these lists? And I'm like, yeah, it's always, always, always good fun. We can chat to you. And it's always... When we get to the top ones, it's like, oh my God. Saying, yeah. The amount of times I've sat there and just gone, yeah, no. and then come back yeah. to... No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's always difficult, but um, mm. it's a it's a band you mentioned earlier, mm. and uh, it's it's the answer. I had a feeling it'd be right up there. Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, you know, when we were talking about it was your choice, you know, this mm. was a, a band that came out right at the right time for me. I'd uh, started on that trajectory from the darkness and jet and white stripes and following this, trying to find this hard rock lineage and uh classic rock were banging on about them you know like really really promoting mm. really heavily promoting them. and i remember back in the days when you used to get like still free cds like taped to the copies yeah. of classic rock mag and all that and it was um uh, it was never too late was on there mm. and they were they were talking about them so much that i was like you know what i'm just going to listen to it and see and never too late came out of the speakers of my hi fi in my room. And I was like, oh, okay. Now I get why, you, you know, now I get why that you're promoting them so much. And it was just before Rise was released. It was like on that cusp. They'd released the, the, the EP, but Rise wasn't quite out yet. Mm. So I had to kind of wait, which is always frustrating when you hear a band just as they're about to release their debut. And you're like, I want to hear more. You can't, you're not allowed. <laughs> Especially like, you know, this was like, what, like 2005. So we're talking like pre-Spotify. 
we're talking mm, no like, access yeah. no access at all it's like i had this one free cd with mm. never too late on it and i just had to keep going to track two i seem to remember it being and just <laughs> going right, right okay put that one on again and mm. you know when rise came out it opens up with under the sky and just that from the moment that riff that intro riff kicked in i was like holy shit Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah this this is a band for me and all the way through you know going through never too late and uh, memphis water and no questions asked i feel like the first six or seven tracks on that album in particular all it's, killer. Just like, it's just like absolutely absolutely um mm-hmm. and then um you know i went off to uni um and there's some guys i knew who were like a couple of years above me and they were talking to the pub one night and we all sort of met up and they were like i could hear them and, and Oh no, so and so is not coming, and blah. We're gonna have to find someone else who wants to come. Blah blah blah. And I was like, "What's well, so up, you guys?" And they're like, "Oh, we're going to a gig on Thursday, but you know, Chris has pulled out, so we need to find someone to ticket." Thing is, no one's heard of this band, and me being mm-hmm. me, she's like, "Oh, who is it?" And then, "Oh, it's the answer." And I was like, "What? I'll come. I'll have the ticket. I'll come with you." And they're like, "Are you sure?" You? And I was like, "Yeah, you know, I love them." And they're like, "Oh, wicked. Yeah, you can come along." So, you know bunked off uni for the afternoon and and went down to see him at the London Bloomsbury Boring Theatre. That was the first time I'd seen him on their um, Be What You Want tour as part of the sort of Rise promotion. Mm. And from seeing him this little the Bloomsbury Boring Theatre, which probably held maybe 300 people, they came out. It was, it was literally a kind of like chest against the stage kind of job venue. You know? There was no, no barriers. There was no gap there was just yeah. stage band <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stage audience bars over there you know i think i think i paid about 12 quid or something for the privilege to go see them. oh it's always something, good when you get that yeah something something ridiculously stupidly pretty cheap and we were so buzzing from that gig the fact that there was the aforementioned gig where i mentioned we missed our last train the reason we missed our last train is because we had word that they were going to a blues bar down the road mm-hmm. and we were like we've got a couple of hours to kill. We should go to the blues bar down the road. And we kind of got trekked to two answer sets because they did go to that blues bar down the road. Mm-hmm. And it was like an open mic kind of cool blues bar. And they got up and did like a few blues numbers and stuff. Like just them mucking about really playing some favorite songs of theirs. And we were like, we've just seen them down the road. And now we get to see them a bit more for free. This is cool. Mm. We got chatting to them and that, and they're really, really nice guys. And also, you know, Cormac's fucking sound. You've had him on the show yeah. uh, as well. And yeah, we ended up missing our set, uh, our train back because we were too busy chatting and we, we were all a bit drunk anyway. But, you know, missed our set back. And we, we were honestly so buzzing from the gig that we didn't even oh, care. Man. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't matter. Oh, we've got to kill, you know, four hours or whatever it was. <laughs> uh, we'll be fine. We did eventually move away from Camden, but that's for, you know, in Camden at four or five in the morning is a strange place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did eventually walk elsewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a story not for this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and then they came and made the impact, you know, and then it was the first band also that I managed to introduce my dad to. Mm. You know? Like my dad always loved his music. He always kept in touch. Like people say, oh, your dad brought you up on the old school stuff, but it was some of it wasn't old school at the time, you know. I was really little, little listening to like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden mm. and Nirvana, Pearl Jam and all that kind of thing, um, you know. And the Prodigy and Rage Against the Machine and stuff like that, you mm. know. My dad was always really on the on the money and on the button with it. And then when I got the answer and I was able to go, you'd like these, yeah, <laughs> which was one rather than the other way around. That felt pretty cool and pretty special. And then once I saw him live, I was like, I, I've got to take Dad to go watch these. And then by chance, when we saw Aerosmith, you know, the ants were opening up. So we did get to see them together. And, you know, to see him supporting Aerosmith and then, like you said, go on to do the big ACDC tour. Mm. It was just like, this is it. They're going all the way. Yeah. They're going all the way. And all their albums have been consistently brilliant. Mm. Up to, you know, just before they went on hiatus when they released the Solus record, which was a bit of a right turn compared to other albums because the others have been very, very blues rock, very foot stomp and party anthem, almost like party rock and roll. Mm. Um, and then they came out with Solus, which was a bit of a right turn. It was more, I don't know, it developed more. It was, there was more Celtic folklore in it and 
mm. and blues grass notes and all these other elements that just changed it slightly. So when they came back with sundowns, um, and I said this to Cormac, like I was really curious as to how sound sundowners was going to sound because obviously mm. the point they left us on was Solus, which was like a like I say like an offshoot. Yeah. The rest of their sound. And to me, Sundowners almost sound like they had the kind of grown upness of Solus as a record. Mm. But it felt like a second debut again. It felt like a mix between yeah. Rise and Solus mm. because it was almost like a reintroduction. This is what the answer are doing now. This is this is the answer now. That was just then. Mm. And I've never seen a band from my era that I liked that much where the internet exploded as much as it did when the announcer went we're back yeah there was a huge buzz around it and it was like back his blood brothers there you go yeah. oh. mm. and, you know i've n- i've not seen them live since they've reformed and i need no. to talk, um because i'm gutted i've not seen them um but i can't wait and yeah you know they're touring consistently for whatever reason i keep missing it and I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, they are absolutely a band that, if I could ever, 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 ever make it work, I would love to have them headline just push play. They would oh, be, like that'd a be killer. It'd be a dream headliner. Um, mm. And uh, my mate Jim, who runs Love Rocks Festival, has just got them the headline his show next year. Um, and and me and Jim have often spoke about the answer and the rise album how because we're similar ages. Yeah, and how it's, um, come up to us. Yeah, and Jim said uh, he, he announced uh, half the they did like a half and half announcement. So I think it was like last Wednesday or something. They announced the first half of the lineup and they announced the second half the following day. So when they announced like Scarlet Rebels and stuff, who obviously had a just push play this year, yeah, yeah. Um, I messaged Jim saying, "Oh, great lineup, mate. You know, as top that is, you know, the Scarlet Rebel boys are great. They'll do you proud, sort of thing." And he messaged me back saying, "Just wait till tomorrow." <laughs> I'm like, "Why? Who you got?" And he's like, just just wait till tomorrow. And then tomorrow came, and I saw the answer closed now on the final day, and I just thought, that is a perfect, absolutely perfect. And like you said, they've kind of gone on to, because they've sort of re-established themselves again mm. with this Sundown, this record. And all the bands that were maybe listening to them on that earlier period are now doing stuff. Like, they've got Kira Max supporting them. And then when I was chatting to Rihanna, and she sort of mentioned that, you know, she loved the answer. Mm. And they've got Kira Max support and all that. There's all these bands now that was definitely influenced by the era that we're, we're talking about. Yeah. And yet the answers seem to have now kind of, along with like, I'd argue the Virgin Marys have done this as well. There's a transition, isn't there? It's almost like a slight transition there where yeah. they've, I mean, the Virgin Marys never stopped, but like the answer, but they've sort of been welcomed into it. And obviously they're on the new wave of classic rock compilation album that they did recently. Yeah. I'm to tell you about that. But the answer seemed to have, as they've come in with the sundown, is almost like a new chapter, like this mm. was again, because it was, was it five or six years between Solus and, and Sun and Sundown. Yeah, it? I think I remember when Cormac was saying, you know, it wasn't supposed to be that long. It was like things yeah. got in the way, but yeah. I I felt that that gap did them really good, mm. you know, because I think it was just. You know, I think that break of like not having them around made people then go, "Oh, hang on a minute, they've got a new record coming out. They're coming back." You know, because they they were a band that were just consistently around, and I think that maybe that was a, a slight problem, mm. and because you know, like people maybe take it for granted a little bit because it's like, well, I can see them whenever. Yeah. Um, but like to have them to have that break and then bring them back and it's like people then they remember the oh I remember Rise I remember yeah. you know uh, all these other stuff that they're up to and uh, you know I remember like New Horizon and and whatnot but um, I think New Horizons are very overlooked album as well I was going to say that's like a <laughs> they're underrated one I feel I, I feel I mean Everyday Demons came out and that is solid. I wrote to hell and everything else that they've done, you know, Solo, so I absolutely adore. But if we're going for the kind of more party style of it, I do think that New Horizon is such Ooh. a good record. Yeah. Like when that came out, I was like, this is almost like Rise Part Two. It's got that kind of vibe. Mm. Got that Similar kind of feel. Vibe. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, there's that first sort of seven or eight tracks on that. It's just like, well, there you go. 
until like mm-hmm. when I saw him at download 2000 and would have been 2015. Um, because yeah, they were doing the 10th anniversary of, of a rise set. So they basically mm-hmm. just did all of rise and they did like four or five of songs from across sort of various albums. I immediately went back to being 18, 17, 18 years old. It just felt me back straight back there to, to the point where I got called out by Cormac. Mm. <laughs> I was, I, 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 I'd, I'd separated from Joe for a couple of bands because she's, yeah. you know, Joe likes her progressive side of things. Mm. So she had gone over to the prog stage because a couple of her favorite bands are over there. And mm. I just sort of main stage tends to be more hard rock. And I had done that thing where like, well, if I'm going to be on my own, I'm going to get drunk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I had quite a few beers and then and then the answer came on and it was just like oh yeah, I, I lost it, you know. I was I was unfortunately that guy. Um to the point where Corbett like halfway through, like singing Never Too Late, or just looked at me, he was like, You're having a good time, my friend. And I was just like <laughs> 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 Yeah. But yeah, I just think that that band that they've inspired so many. Mm. Uh, this next generation of the the next the new wave of uh yeah. we've put in it. and yeah i don't know a single person that loves what we love mm. that doesn't love the answer this is it isn't it so, um yeah they gotta be my number two man mm, no i completely agree with it uh my number one Ooh. i know this was like a really I'm tough one i think this I was the the hardest one out of all of these to choose um even even picking a particular album for this band was mm. difficult uh so i have gone with blackstone cherry uh, as the number one choice um obviously they formed back in 2001 believe it or not uh but they didn't release the the debut until 05 um for me though i am going to edge folklore and superstition as the one because although i like for me they're like always jostling for position the debut album and uh and folklore i think folklore is like them at their fully accomplished sound i think that they're, it's slightly more polished it's just like you know you've 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 just sorted it, you know, just tweaked it slightly, you know, you made a few changes here and there and you've got this like amazing polished product. And, um, you know, they open like blind man and, and, and loads of tracks that are now staples in their set, you know, pieces free, as we mentioned earlier. Um, but oh, I mean, uh, on, on a day, it could be any, either of these albums. This is why I was saying it's so difficult to choose. But as you mentioned, you know, again, this is another band, you know, I remember Lonely Train being on a, what was it, a wrestling game. There was a wrestling game that came out and uh, it was on that. It was just, you know, on one of the menu screens, you know, come around every so often. And I was like what the hell is this? Cause it sounds completely different to anything else that's on this <laughs> weird game. Uh, and I remember my dad comes in one day with his new, with his, a uh, classic rock magazine CD. And he goes, I have a new band that you will enjoy. And they're called Blackstone. And I went, I know who they are already. <laughs> it was like, I have finally found a band that I've heard of before you. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken me about, or oh, at this point, at least 10 years. Um, <laughs> but we finally found one because it was like, it was, it was an interesting thing. They, they hit this balance between appealing to this mainstream audience and appealing to this kind of uh, hard rock slightly even southern mm. style you know that, that they had going on there um and again it was you know i remember playing their the music in school you know secondary school and people were like who the hell's this you know like usually people would go oh you listen to crap you know you want to listen to whatever some new metal band or something yeah. and then these guys come on and it's like oh this is like other people are going who the hell's that yeah. like they're really cool um and it's, they they have this interesting balance for me between old school and modern. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, they ride that line. They're, they're like both at the same time, which is an interesting thing. Um, I mean, there's there's just so many great tracks. I mean, off either album, um, yeah. you know, there's a, a folklore. There's like Ghost of Floyd Collins, and that's like what yeah. track number twelve. Like you're you're really deep into the album, yeah, yeah, and it's just like. Keys. Keys is there just after that? Is it keys just after that? Yeah, like it's just like one after another, after another, after another. Not all the way through. Um, you know, there's like Devil's Queen, and you know, there's just so much like great tracks that are on either album. Um, and I think that they just really made a a massive impact. You know, you hear uh, particularly how they they mix their albums. You know, those two albums in particular, they had such a full kind of, uh, you know, you know, if you look at the waveform, it's like a big block, isn't it? Because it's like everything's been pushed. And nowadays, like, that's kind of the standard. That's what every band does. Like, near as damn it. Um, And I feel that they were kind of one of those first ones that were doing that, you know, of that era. That they were they were the ones that were pushing it up for radio. They were the ones that had this kind of wall of sound and this real kind of useful energy, but this connection to the past at the same time, but not living in the past. So that you know they they weren't really a retro band, but they were they were a band for now. Um, I mean the, the following that they have as well. It's an interesting. Mixture. I mean, I went to go and I went to go and see one of their low key shows that they did just recently, a few like uh, about a month ago. Oh, you went to the Rescue Room show, didn't you? Yeah, they played the Rescue Room. So for people that don't know what the Rescue Rooms is, it's like a four hundred and fifty cap venue. So they deliberately played a series of shows that were like smaller venues, so kind of reminiscent to when they first uh, toured the UK. Some of these venues they did go back to. Um. But, you know, you're in the queue and you're speaking to people and it was interesting that the the, the crowd that was there because the, the, there was like some people that I would class as a mainstream crowd. Like mm-hmm. if I was to say to people like Rival Sons, who you think, oh, everybody will know who they are. There's people that hadn't heard of Rival Sons that were there. There's people, You know what I mean? Like there's people that that are like they'll know who the darkness are. They'll know who, like uh, Aerosmith are, and these yeah, kind of bands. Foo Fighters, Chili Peppers. Yeah, that. they'll know Foo Fighters. They'll know Chili Peppers. They'll know these kind of bands, but they won't know these other ones that maybe we're talking about now. And I found that really interesting because it's like you were, you were appealing to two audiences at the same time. You know, there was there was somebody next to me, and you can you know you hear them because you're like sardined in together and there was this guy that was saying oh have you heard this band have you heard this band and they were like no <laughs> and they, these were like you know as i say rival sons and, and this and the other like they'd heard of like jack white and the white stripes and stuff but there was it was that interest it was almost like the radio rock crowd as well yeah but they just embraced everything and it was great it was great to see that um so yeah i think that they they're kind of that bridge between the two and i i think that they're certainly going back to i mean we we, we touched on it they're going back to that mm. original era now as well which for me is is great because i i i do enjoy most of their their catalog but those first two in particular like on depending on the day it could be the debut album or it could be folklore but yeah. those first two are the two that are kind of my example of what a modern rock band should be today. Um, so I have to put it at number one when I say that's the example, that's the benchmark. So that's my number one. Uh, so what is Lee's number one? The big reveal. Big reveal. Because I have no idea who this could be <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Um, oh, I, hang on a minute. I've got, there's one left. I know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I nearly had your film, mate. Yeah, there's one left. Yeah. Go on. Um, it's Rival Sons. It's of be. course it's Rival Sons. 
Um, is <laughs> a band for me. Like you said, there are so many bands that we love that are mm. on the scene currently that would cite Rival Sons as a massive influence. Yes. I think it's a massive tip to the hats of the guys that 90%, probably more, of the people when you interview them and you say, when well, you can you can go for a band from the past and a yeah. band from the present to tour with, who would you tour with? And 99 times out of 10, they'll say, Rival Sons for the current yeah. band. To the point where he, he said it himself. Even Jay Buchanan himself. <laughs> 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 um they're just one of those bands and uh, as you know this this week um i've been fortunate enough to go to four gigs in six days yes um, and seeing the likes of don martin that truth mm. twice <laughs> uh once with glenn hughes uh once on their own mm. and rival sons last friday and all bands were absolutely phenomenal um you know all bands are in- insane and so having seen Rival Sons again live recently, I'm just reminded once again just what a force they are. Mm. And there was something different in the way they've been on these shows. And I've noticed a few people say it, not in a bad way, just the shift in mood yeah. maybe about the stage. A, a confidence more maybe. Mm. Um, maybe it's the new material. Maybe they're just really, really invested in it. Um, obviously, you, you and I, we both spoke to Jay about Dark Fire and, and Lightbringer. Um, you spoke to Scott about Lightbringer, of course, but uh, we both spoke to the guys about the record. Yeah. And I know Jay's really invested in it. I know Scott is as well. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet the guys last Friday, and they were really excited. And last Friday, of course, was the uh, release date for Lightbringer, the second part, mm. like for the sister album. So they played it in its entirety from front to back. From Dark Fire to Mosaic. And it was an album that was released on the day <laughs> that they played Gamebridge. So it's not like it was even been out 24 hours and they're doing the whole thing. Yeah. Now you would expect, quite naturally, for a drop to go in the energy levels because it's not the mm. songs people know. They're not, you know, you'd expect it to drop from, you know, they opened up with um, Mirrors from Dark Fire. Yeah. And then they kind of went into a selection of uh, stuff from Dark Fire and stuff from previous releases like Wrestle of Great Western Valkyrie and Fell Roots and Hollow Bones and obviously Pressure and Time and Head Down and everything else. And they were going through the thing and the energy levels up here. Mm. They went into Dark Year and then they walked off the stage and let it ring. As you know, if you play the albums back to Dark Fire and like bring it together, Dark Year kind of morphs into Dark Fire with that into it. So they came over and they just went straight into Dark uh, Fire, the track. So they're starting a, a set of a brand new album with a nine minute song. Yeah. Which stereotypically. It's diff tough. It's tough. Like yeah. stereotypically, it would be tough. But everyone in that crowd was just, whether they'd managed to hear the album before they got down, obviously a few had because if quite a few people would sing along to various songs and they mm. obviously think I was fortunate because, like yourself, speaking to the guys prior to the interview, and then we got to hear the album a little ahead of time so that we could talk about it yeah. um, with, with them. Um, so I'd obviously heard it and a few others had as well. And you could see people who just obviously just like us, big rival sons fan. I just, so, you know, you could, they were probably, I want to talk like, about it, yeah. but you can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... oh, it's like, that's why I was messaging you so much going, right. Yes. To that <laughs> it's like, have you heard it yet? Cause I can't really say if I have or not, but you know, <laughs> Just see everyone who'd heard it and everyone who not were at the same energy level. And they, they, whether they were soaking up or they were reflecting it back, it was just their energy level, man. And it was insane. And it's the best time I've ever seen them. And I've seen them about 26 times. Mm. And from the moment I heard Pressure and Time, the single, which is the first song I've heard, um, that album will always be a pretty special album to me. I, think I mentioned it before it was kind of the album that got me back into music again because yeah yeah you know, i lost my dad and uh music to us was part of our relationship with friendship seeing take me see aerosmith when i was 11 all the way through seeing alton bridge you know a few weeks before he died and all that and music was a big mm. thing so like even tonight you know i've mentioned my dad in these stories of, of bands and stuff yeah. so it's always there 
So for a while, I was like, oh, it was a bit too painful, you know. I can't listen to this band because I'll, this memory comes up or that memory comes up. And then Rival Sons came along. And the old band, yeah. New band. There's no emotional ties to my dad with it. There's no kind of, it's not going to revoke any memories that is too painful at this point in time. Mm. And it was too fucking good to ignore, to be blunt. Mm. And it came out, and that pressure, t- I was so excited. I was like a little teenage kid again. Mm. Like, I literally, like, I had the day off work, and Joe didn't, and we weren't living together then. And I literally <laughs> was like, I heard pressure in time, and I was like, what is this? And I just kept playing it, like the YouTube video, just on loop, just on the music video, like for, for ages. I was like, this, I, I just got that excitement back again, and I hadn't had it for so long. Mm. I was like, this is, this is amazing. And I ran into see Joe, you know, like when she going for work, and she like drove straight over there. And before I barely said hello to the poor woman, she's like, "I'm like, you need to watch this." Yeah. And then I always remember looking at her watch. She went, "I got your back, Lee's back." And it was that moment I didn't realize that that was such a big part of me that I'd mm. been ignoring. So they gave me that back. So that album will always be precious. But then they come along with head down, and I'm like, "How do they get better than pressure and time?" And then Great Western Valkyrie comes along. And, you know, in that point, Robin Everhart had left playing bass and then Dave Best came into the band. And it's that thing where you think, oh, well, it's a new member. How new How dynamic. is that going to change the dynamic? Yeah. And a bit similarly with Blackstone Cherry and, and you know, Jordan mm. Hall leaving. And it's the first record that they've done, uh, you know, with, with the new guy. And that's, the record's great. And Great Western Valkyrie comes along and I'm thinking, oh, the first two, you know, pressure and time and the head down was so good. How's it? How's this going to change it? And it's arguably one of their finest hours. Mm. Then Hollow Bones comes along, like I said before. It took me a little longer to get into that, I think, because it was such a shift in sound. Yeah. Because it had gone from a more kind of riff oriented thing to a more expansive sound with Hollow Bones, mm. which then kind of expanded more with Fell Roots. And these these two albums even more so. And I'm gonna put my neck on the line and I'm gonna say to date. <laughs> There because we go. every time I, I say, know. this it is happens. the best one they've done. They come out with another <laughs> record, and I go, I'm going to have to look like a twat because I said this on the last record, but this is the best thing that they've done. So and which one are we going thing. with? I'm going with Lightbringer. Wow. Um, it may be because I'm still on a bit of a high from four gigs, and seeing it from <laughs> was a, a real privilege because you, you know that's not probably going to happen when they come next round again, you know. Mm. And when I said when I spoke to Jay, I would love to see them do a tour where they did all of Di- all of Dark Fire into Lightbringer. Mm. I'd love to see that because I've seen them a, a, a lot of times yeah. and um, seen all the other songs that I want to hear a lot. Don't get me wrong. Friday night when they come out with Electric Man, oh, I'm great. off to the sound. Like, you know, and Jay was Jay was ecstatic when they, they played Open My Eyes because that's one of her favorites. You know, we're all happy to whether they were playing, but. I would love to see that because to me, between the two albums, mm. they've created some of the best work here. I really do believe that. Yeah, and it's yeah. hard to say one or the other because I know they've been released as two separates, but they really are a combined piece of work. Mm. And it's literally the other side of the story, even lyrically and sonically and everything. Yeah. So they really are a, a unit to me. Um, but everyone, like, as soon as I put up, you know, I went to see Rival Sons last night, had a great time, blah, 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 and some photos. I had like comments from um, people like the guys in Blue Nation, mm. um, Howland Tides Boyds, you know, people who are making their own careers right now and people mm. who, I, who, who I admire on this new wave. Or oh, I went to go see them in such and such. It was great. Oh, I'm gutted. I missed out. We were playing here, hoping to see them later. And it was fantastic. And the whole show was great. And there's just an energy about them live that I don't think you get with many other bands. I'll mm. say many because, you know, people experience different things, so I'm not going to say no one does it. But I think for me personally, there's one or two that are on par, but they're not within the elder generation of the new wave of classic rock. I'll say that mm. for me. Um, and for that reason, and uh, so many more, they're my number one. Yeah, I mean... Uh- it's hard to argue. I mean, I think that there's there's certainly the one that has influenced most mm. out of uh, you know for this new era. Um, 
you know, you hear, as, as I've said, over and over again, <laughs> the common theme, oh, I'd love to tour with rival sons. And, you know, you can't blame them because it's, I mean, they, they would be a, I think they'd be a tough act to actually open for, but, yeah, I um, because the expectation is just so high, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to choose which album, either Dark Fire or Lightbringer. It's really tough, mm. especially with them being released, you know, both being released this year. Yeah. They're both very fresh. And they're both stunningly good. Mm. I remember saying to you when we were both talking about Dark Fire when that came out, and we were saying, you know, we both thought Feral Roots was the top album they were going to do. Then they've come out with Dark Fire. And we just knew if we said this is their best album of the day. We knew there was another one coming along. And how is that, how's that going to work? Um, mm. And you do think stereotypically, there are a few exceptions to the rule, but stereotypically, I'm not a fan of the double album. Yeah. It's, I just think certain double albums that I look at, and everyone's got their own opinions, but... It's got stuff that you could probably tick out. Yeah, you, could, could, yeah, you know, yeah. like Guns N' Roses is usually Illusion 1 and 2. Mm. I think you could arguably cut a lot of that off and make a really cool solid record. Uh, Metallica's Load and Reload. I feel the same about that. I think there's a lot of stuff you could cut away and make again make a really good solid record. Mm. Chili Peppers, Stadium Arcadium. I think that's the same. And there's there's exceptions to the rule, of course there always is. But when they said, "Oh, we're doing a double album," I was like, "Okay." Or they're doing a sister album. I should say it's never been promoted as a double album because it's released separately. But they're going to show both sides of this story that they were telling across the across the mm. uh, songs. There was a part of me that was like. Oh yeah, me and double albums. Maybe this won't be the one for no. It, it, there's not a song on it that I would cut out. I mean, mm. I love the fact that you know mirrors that opens Darkfire is more or less opposite of Mosaic. That yeah, Lightbringer. and it's another way of looking at a smash in the mirror, smash mirror, or is it a mosaic? Mm. And there's all these intricacies all the way through. Um, that are almost. A, you know, an answer and call thing. Mm. It's such a good record. And seeing them perform these songs live on Friday was absolutely stunning. And um, when I was speaking to Jay, he was clearly so excited by these. Yeah. Songs. You could feel it. Um, you could really feel it that this record meant something to him, particularly. Um, I know he's an artist who, like all the guys in Royal Sons, aren't going to just put anything out there. They're not, they're not a throwaway band. They're very emotionally invested in what they do, like like any artist is. And a lot of these bands that we spoke about are exactly the same. But you could really feel when I was talking to... When, I'm sure you felt the same from what you just said, but I could really feel when I was talking to Jay that there's 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 a lot of his heart and soul all across these two these two yeah. records. He was He was evidently quite proud of what he'd done. Yeah, and you know he's not like a, you know I think I think some people get confused with Jay. Sometimes they think always oh, a bit of a big head, but he's not. Um, no, he's, really he's not. He, yeah, he's just got this kind of real deep kind of mentality. He really thinks about what he's going to do and what yeah, he's going to say. You could tell um, every answer that he gave when we were talking. Yeah, he wanted to make sure he took his time to answer him, and not in a horrible way. But no, you could tell that the, the 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 art that obviously he created with the rest of the guys. Mm. meant so much more to him that he wanted to articulate it in yeah. the right way. He it wanted was like, this is important. Yeah, this is important so, enough yeah. for me to take a moment to mm. think about what I'm going to say here. Yeah. Not in a trying to trick anyone or be big-headed or anything like <laughs> that. But just in a, no. I just I love what I'm doing so much. I want to find the right words to tell you. Mm. And that really came across. And I think that comes across on the album. I think mm. it comes across live. So, with it being the most recent of the two pieces, I am going to just go with Lightbringer. No, that's fair enough, and um, yeah, that does uh, conclude our uh, what we're going to call it. We're going to say the original new wave of classic rock uh, top ten. Um, yeah, it was a tough one, but we did get there. <laughs> we did manage to do it. I think I think it's a fair list. E either of them there, you know, I think we have some real good balance in there. Um but yes, where where can people find Lee if they want to see more of Lee do his interviews with J Buchanan and Yeah, well they can uh, follow the the rock show Lee Graham on on YouTube and Spotify if you want to catch up with old ones. 
Um, if you're free on a Friday night, six to eight, you can find me on RWSFM doing my radio show. And then uh, those shows go up on my Mixcloud account as well, catching up with those. Mm. And uh, if people want to jump over to Lee's YouTube channel, which uh, I think deserves a bit more love, quite frankly, um, you can see that appear pretty much now, magically yeah. on the screen. Um, and yes, we will see you next time. And the next time we do see you, will be for our top 10 albums of the year, which is going to be, I think, the toughest one to date that we may have to go through. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a hard one. We've got two more Extra Vibe episodes left of the year. We've got the top 10 albums of the year, and we've got, uh, of course, the the cover Sid Beyond the Vibe Awards at the end of the year. (laughs) Um, And I think it's going to be the hardest year. So, yeah. Stay tuned for that, and um, yeah, we will see you next time.